Do you have the sense that something is missing in your life? A feeling that you're not good enough? And if you ever have this belief, if I could just get X, Y, Z, then I would be enough. And hopefully you've discovered that attaining basic material goals like the ideal relationship, the ideal job, car, amount of money, lifestyle, would somehow finally fulfill you. So if you've ever been in the situation where you say, if I could just get, then I'd be all right. Then everything would be okay. Then everything would be fine. That actually means that you're somewhere on the spectrum of addiction. If any of these are true, then you're on the spectrum of addiction. If you are lost in your life, or you're afraid to admit to even yourself how much you are fearful of the future, or of death, or of other people, or of being poor, or of not being good enough, or sexy enough, or thin enough, or tough enough, or alpha enough, or famous enough, if you feel you are not enough, and that if you could only X, Y, or Z, then everything would be fine, then you are on the spectrum of addiction. And uh, it's a good time to, to contemplate the hidden power of recovery in life and love. And we're going to be walking through um, the most powerful um, and uh, most efficacious self-help program in history so far, the 12-step program. And we'll be looking specifically at its application through the Alcoholics Anonymous Big Book, especially as the first major statement of a modern 12 steps. And briefly looking at the origins of it and how it connects with uh, many traditions that are thousands of years old and how would that applies to your life. It is, in fact, probably the best way uh, to approach um, optimizing or getting better at your dating life and in your relationships and actually at any major thing psychologically in your life that you want to attain. Uh, so the 12 steps. Now, this is a photo um, that I found on Google Images that uh, came up when I typed in recovery, Alcoholics Anonymous or something like that. I think this is from Sex Anonymous, uh, a group. Anyway, I like how this is, it's a circle. It's a, it's a bridge that looks quite natural. It's made out of wood and stone. And uh, in the reflection, it's a circle. And often a Western approach, Western as an enlightenment forward, approach to transformation is in some kind of linear fashion where you're starting off, you're not so great, and then you get better and better and better, like you're climbing a mountain kind of thing, and you end up on the summit. And you think, I've made it. Okay, so that's, that's a, um, what I call a drive approach. And I actually have a course to help you do that. As you mature and as you climb summits and you, um, you get to the top and you realize that it's not so great after a few minutes of looking around, that you're looking for the next summit and the next summit. And eventually you'll get tired of summiting all the time and um, you wonder, what's the point of all of this? And why did I feel so strongly that I had to get to the top of this mountain in the first place? And all the sacrifices you made to get to the top, looking back now at the, your path, may not have been worth it, or maybe you sacrificed things that you shouldn't have and so forth. And in fact, as you mature, you hopefully will see that it's not just a linear fashion, but that it's circular. And um, we're going to be exploring how it is circular. And uh, for those who've done Masculine Mastery, this course that I pair with Rock Solid Relationships, the bonus module, module 11, so at the end, there's another level, and that's uh, where we explore Joseph Campbell's uh, hero's journey in depth, and you'll notice that that also is, is a circular journey. But it's, it's not so much a circle as a spiral. So you're getting somewhere. It's not like you're ending up exactly in the same place like in some kind of Groundhog Day nightmare, but that it is in a circular fashion, and a spiraling outwards would probably be a better way of thinking about it, a better metaphor. Okay, so I'm going to preface this video if we ever release it um, with another slide that you don't need to know about. So let's get into the 12-step program. Now, um, I forgot to put the actions on these slides, so unfortunately you see everything at once. You'll get the deck at the end, so you don't need to like copy anything. <clears throat> In a way, this is also my notes, <laughs> and they're quite copious. I wanted to make less than half of the number of slides I ended up making, um, so you get a more detailed set of slides than normal. But hopefully that will work out for your benefit. Okay, the 12-step program and how effective it is, just in case you didn't know about it. And uh, just as background for how I came to get to, to this information, I first started studying clinical psychology about five, six years ago. And the further I got into it, the more the references to uh, practical programs, especially group therapy, kept popping up. And whenever you think about group therapy, the most effective group therapy in modern history 
well, I guess modern, in history, is uh, the anonymous, or the anonymous groups, the 12-step anonymous groups, and the big book. So like any other class book of uh, a classical, classic literature, when I dove into the big book, it was quite arcane seeming. It, lots of references to God and very overtly Christian. And um, it was bizarre because there are these heavily tattooed drug, former drug users and alcoholics who swear by it. And the last thing you'd think that they would hand you is like a tract for the evangelical gospel or something. <laughs> but that's what it was. And then it took me a while to read around it. I read the Sex Addicts Anonymous book, the, uh, the Narcotics Anonymous book, trying to read the more uh, modern versions of it. And then they've recently got issued a revised and updated version um, though everyone still says the classic one is the best. So I didn't feel equipped because I personally haven't attended any anonymous groups myself. I didn't think that that would be right to just go for research purposes. Um, so uh, we, we have um, joining us later today um, someone who knows that world pretty well. Uh, so um, he's on his way and hopefully we'll be able to chime in with practical experiential um, sharing that will help enrich our knowledge here. So. This has been about two to three years in the making for me, and I'm still getting deeper into my understanding of transformation through a 12-step program. And uh, now, but now I feel like, okay, I know enough, I can present quite a lot, and probably too much, actually, for the time allotted. All right, so there have been over 150 studies on the efficacy of a 12-step program, specifically in the anonymous groups, over the past three decades, well over 150 because uh, the last literature review I looked up was like a decade old, so I'm sure that there are a lot more since then. So actually, I should adjust that to the past four decades. Uh, one of the studies out of University of Minnesota tracked 1,083 people and looked at them at the various points, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. At the 12-month point, there was a 53% uh, self-reported abstinence from alcohol and other drugs during their treatment year. And then another 35% say they'd reduce their chemical use. Between 70 to 90% of these clients reported improved quality of life in areas such as relationships and job performance. So that far, is far more effective than any um, other kind of treatment, uh, including one-on-one -on -one talk therapy on a weekly basis. Obviously, all of these things should, would probably be best done together. And if you want to go deeper into the, the studies, you can just Google them. That's what I did. <laughs> okay, and then uh, Thomas McLennan, Professor, uh, director of the Treatment Research Institute at Penn, concedes that though many people who attend AA during treatment do not end up attending regularly, he says, uh, however, uh, that even though AA isn't for everybody, what needs to be said, and it's time for psychologists and other professional people to say it, for those who attend, it works damn well. So just like any other treatment, if you don't take the treatment or stick with it, it's not going to work. You actually have to follow the program. But for those who actually follow the program, um, it it's very uh, effective. Okay, <clears throat> so hopefully that's enough. And if you still doubt how powerful this is, you can just Google it yourself. But we're gonna just dive in and assume you are convinced enough to, to learn more. <clears throat> the origins come out of the, uh, a movement called the Oxford Group, which, is a, which was an evangelical movement, Christian evangelical. The co-founders of, of the AA um, and co-authors of the big book were Bill Wilson and Bob Smith. Is that? Oh, okay, they're coming up. And this was in the 20s and 30s when it was really popular, and then they started creating these groups. The Oxford Group was founded on the belief in the necessity of personal conversion, a transforming spiritual experience, confession, and restitution. And you'll see that pattern in the 12 steps. An idea, the idea of a conversion, amen, a spiritual experience, confession of being a big part of it, the anonymity that's worked into it, that uh, trying to remove the ego from the equation, is all consonant with these religious traditions. Okay, so this is also consistent with personal transformation traditions that focus on character formation. So at the last summit, we explored, in Bangkok, we explored uh, virtues. Virtues, vice, and getting better with women. You think those things wouldn't go together, um, but uh, that is the missing element. We explored Confucian virtues, Confucian vices, uh, the, from the Catholic tradition as well. Uh, but every major religious tradition has some sort of transformation experience built into it. The way you are, how you need to be, and how you get there. And almost always, in fact always, I can't think of an exception of any major religious tradition, the focus is on creating a certain type of character. So that if you 
adopt this character, then you naturally will achieve that next level. So Christian, Confucian, Buddhist, Taoist, if that matters to you, if you're a hardcore atheist and that turns you off, then just ignore it. Okay, it doesn't really matter. But in case you're sort of like me and you like history and you like to know that you're not reinventing the wheel, that you're actually uh, building on the collective wisdom of, uh, tradition, of thousands of years of tradition, then you can take heart in the fact that uh, the wisest people in human history also came upon something like a 12-step program. And we'll also look at uh, basic clinical psychology. They have a five-point explanation and how that um, connects with 12-step. Okay, so you might be wondering, how does this connect with what I'm doing? I'm not an addict or not overtly one, or actually, you probably don't think you're an addict at all. So how does this relate to your life? There are 12-step programs for a lot of things. Did you, did you, you said there's like 200-something of these? Okay, so 270. 270, all right, yeah. So here are some examples. There are programs for uh, drugs, sex, relationships, food, work, smoking, alcohol, technology, pornography, hoarding, gambling, and the list goes on. Um, these are all based on a neurotic compulsion. So a, an addiction is, is basically a neurotic compulsion, which means that you're compelled outside of your own control. It's the neurotic part that you keep going back to it and back to it. Um, the, however, so the good, important point to realize is that the needs and drives and instincts and impulses underlying the behavior are universal and always positive in their intent. You're trying to meet your needs, but you're doing them through, with an external vehicle that is uh, destructive, or that you're doing it in a destructive manner. The biggest addiction, so this is a deep hypothesis, and I'll put this out there to start. The biggest addiction is to your problems, or the stories you tell yourself about uh, what your problems mean, either for you or for life. We're going to unpack that as we go through this. And these problems become your emotional home. Okay, so that's what creates that addictive cycle, that, there, that this is the way your life is and that you see it this way, this kind of narrative, and that sucks you into a destructive cycle. There are obvious addicts, that is like from the outside, there are socially sanctioned addicts, like, okay, you're an addict, drugs, alcohol, those are more overt. But then there are also long-form con addicts. I stole that phrase from Russell Brand. Oh, by the way, um, one of the reasons I decided I can now do this is because um, I saw uh, Russell Brand's book, Recovery, and the way he explained the 12-step program in, in like cool language, like normal language, uh, liberal use of the F word. And uh, I thought, oh, that's a great way to explain it to people. And um, why didn't I think of that? So um, seems like using the word fuck is a really great way of explaining any deep stuff. So maybe I should do that, like Confucius according to fuckery. <laughs> So anyway, the long form con, uh, Russell Brand's phrase, I'm not sure if you got it from somewhere else. And this is uh, where you adopt a, a false self or like you, you become, you, you try to meet your needs in neurotic and compulsive ways, uh, but that those needs are, or the, those ways are socially sanctioned, like work for instance is one, that um, you may be ad addicted to fitness is another one. That may be like, there's, there's a whole part of society that applauds you for that and that doesn't see the destructive um, fallouts of your relationship or, or of your home life or something like that. Anyway, so these are the long from con, which is to say you're going through the motions and you don't realize it until many, many years or decades down the road that um, it's all been a ruse or an attempt to distract yourself from facing the deeper issues and the deeper pain and sadness. Okay, the long form con. And if you're watching this and you don't self-identify as an addict, but you're thinking, I wonder what David has to say about how the 12-step program can help me get women. Well, first of all, maybe you shouldn't be watching this. Uh, but secondly, uh, great, this is, you, you probably are in a kind of long form con situation. And I'll share, um, and I'll, I'll be sharing along the way uh, my own journey uh, through, the, through something like a 12-step program. At each step, I'll, I'll share a little bit. And then, um, uh, you can probably see the, the pattern in your own life uh, as well as you get through it. So this could be bad relationships, bad food. If you're addicted to, if you see consistently, frequently in your life that you get into bad relationships, a lot of guys do. They keep attracting the wrong women or the relationships get toxic and then they blame the relationships or the women instead of looking in the mirror and seeing that the one thing in common among all of their toxic relationships is them. <laughs> They're the common element. Bad relationships, bad food, abusive bosses. If you keep ending up in toxic work situations, 
maybe there's something deeper there probably is conflict, uh, pornography, work, working out, other problems in general, even issues with um, being unable to assert yourself and then lashing out. I noticed this recently in the Man Up group, guys who are like learning about assertiveness and they're recovering nice guys, reco recovering codependents, and then they're calibrating too far the wrong way and they're focusing on the outward behavior and using that to compensate for their deep insecurities instead of looking at their deep insecurities. Okay, so these are, you can get addicted to all of these coping strategies. <clears throat> all right, so in fact, the addictive behavior is, an, is a coping strategy. So maybe we'll use language that I've used before in many other videos to help you see that. So there are many ways to get out of the coping strategies. One that I've covered before in other videos is grief work. And that's something you do with a therapist in a private trusting space. Um, but another really great way is, and a free way is, well, free if, you're, uh, if you identify with any of the anonymous groups, is to do group therapy in an anonymous group. Um, and uh, we also provide that through our coaching groups in a more um, pointed or directed way for a specific goal. But that's the idea, group work, and we're doing some group work here, which has a... Uh, advantage over over one-on-one. -on -one. So those are best paired. Okay, so the modern age of addiction. So I should have started, in fact, with these questions. Do you have the sense that something is missing in your life? A feeling that you're not good enough? And in the quiet moments, in the darkness, if you ever are truly honest with yourself, you will find the answer to that is yes, that sometimes you feel like you're not good enough because that's one of the greatest fears of all human beings that we're born naked and vulnerable into the world and that we need, like we literally need somebody to feed and clothe us and care for us or we will literally die. So these are founded on the fear of death, which if you can deal with that, then leads to the next fear is that you're not gonna be loved because if you're not loved, then you'll die. And then that's let lead, uh, what leads into that is the fear that you're not good enough because if you're not good enough for love, then you won't get love. If you don't, don't, if you don't get love, you will die. Those are ingrained in our DNA. Um, I, I can probably come up with a, a story. Uh, let me just make sure I muted this. Oh, great, it's muted automatically. Come up with a story on why, um, uh, why that's so in terms of our evolutionary adaptation, uh, but hopefully you can already sense that that's true for you. It's a universal, these are universal fears. I call these the twin terrors. The fear that you're not good enough and the fear that you're not loved. And all of our neediness and neuroses go back to our attempts to grapple with those fears, to manage those fears, to regulate them, to make them not come up to the surface so much. And if you are of an existential or philosophical bent, you probably have gone through the tortured soul type of uh, phase where you're like, what's the point of all of this? And you've taken too many other substances to distract yourself from the meaninglessness of your life. Um, you can see uh, a couple of years ago, I did a video series on the denial of death, Ernest Becker's books. Um, uh, uh, evil and, and Denial of Death is uh, two books, uh, and it was a four-video series where we covered it in a summit in New York City. And uh, that was, for me to go through that book was also an attempt to grapple with the fear of death, obviously, and hopefully you've done that yourself, because that helps you to face the meaninglessness of your life, unless you have something greater. And uh, addiction is a way of coping with all that. Okay, I probably went just too deep being on slide six here. Uh, and if you ever have this belief, if I could just get X, Y, Z, then I would be enough. And the X, Y, Z obviously is your placeholders for, if I could just get enough money, if I could just get the job I wanted. If you think back to when you were in high school, if I could just get into that university, then I, I would be set. Or if you went to grad school, if I could just get into that grad school, if I could just get into Harvard Law, then I'd be set. And then you get to Harvard Law and you're like, fuck, if I could just get into Law Review, I guess. Oh, fuck. If I could just get that appointment, I, and then the list goes on and on until it, pretty much you're di you've died. Uh, or you wake up to the existential crisis of your life. And hopefully you've discovered, having lived long enough and strive, striven and achieved, that attaining basic material goals like the ideal relationship, the ideal job, car, amount of money, lifestyle, would somehow finally fulfill you, seeing that that is not true. But there, it's very tempting. There's still that next stage. Even for me, um, if you, over, uh, if you focus too much on a particular goal, and that goal is, goal is really long term, then after a while it becomes like a holy grail. If it's been with you for three or four years, you just kind of want to be done with it. And you might lose sight of the bigger picture that even if you do get that, it's going to be empty at the end if you didn't enjoy the ride on the way to the destination. There are, of course, 
uh, proper ways of looking at the ideals, and we'll be getting that to that towards the end. But the way people idealize those those goals is neurotic and will lead to the addictive cycle. So if you've ever been in the situation where you say, I'm going to repeat this a few times throughout this uh, seminar, if I could just get, then I'd be all right. Then everything would be okay. Then everything would be fine. That actually means that you're somewhere on the spectrum of addiction, which means also that 99% of the world is somewhere on the spectrum of, of addiction. That means you're actually, um, you need to let go is one of the first things you need to do. But let's get into it, because the very first thing you need to do is step one. Makes sense, right? Step one. Um, so uh, step one is, this is right out of the big book, the AA big book. We admitted that we were powerless over our addiction, that our lives had become unmanageable. Russell Brand's interpretation is, are you a bit fucked? <laughs> it's a brilliant book. Uh, it's a great way to bring it all home. I thought it was a really brilliantly read book, uh, written book. Highly recommend it to everyone. One of the best self-help books I've seen in, in past few years. And uh, there are some parts that are quite long-winded, as I can be, so I can appreciate that. <laughs> Addiction is coping with your feelings through externalizing strategies. Okay, so that's my language in there. Uh, you can see I've been in universities for too long. What that means is you have these feelings of inadequacy or, that, or fears that you're not going to be loved or something along those lines. So in, instead of dealing with it directly, you, uh, external, you, you look to an, externalized, an external object and you focus on that as the way to get those needs met of certainty, also of unpredictability, of love and connection, significance, and, you do, and it ends up uh, becoming quite unhealthy. The objects themselves are not intrinsically bad. So even drugs can have a proper use, uh, medicinally or something like that. They're not, the, the physical objects in and of themselves are not bad. So what often ha has happened in toxic societies is they project all of the negative emotion associated with the behavior and the outcome to the external object. And they end up becoming quite judgmental and it just makes it more toxic. So realizing that the problem is you and your patterns and not the external object, so you don't blame the thing itself. So you can get addicted to anything. You can use anything, any external object, or even ways of thinking um, that are, that, that in and of themselves might be helpful to some, in, in some context, uh, or aren't bad on their own, um, but that the way you use them uh, makes them toxic for you. And uh, here's a common saying in anonymous groups. First, the activity was fun, or first, the using was fun, then the fun, then it was fun with problems, and then it was just problems. Right. So there is that, that cycle. So just like I mentioned, like first, you have a goal, and it, it seems like a really good goal because it gets you going and you're excited about it. Then after it drags on for years and years and years, all you do is obsess over that goal. And then all, you've come, all you feel are the negativity, is the negativity associated with it. In clinical psychology, there's a well... Uh, documented and common approach to addiction. That's five points. And it starts with pain. You have some pain that you're trying to avoid. You use an external, uh, externalized coping strategy, such as alcohol, food, sex, work, or relationships, to soothe or distract yourself from the pain. Then you get that temporary relief and soothing. Then the fallout occurs, and you're like, fuck, this sucks. And then you have shame and guilt, and then that leads to you feeling like shit again, which then, which then triggers the pain again, and then the whole cycle continues, right? Repeats itself. Yeah. So the, way, the way AA really looks at it is that your addiction is the pain. Mm. So yeah. You, the disease of addiction is your behavior, it's just causing the pain, and the drugs or whatever is just a symptom. Mm. So first, when you come there, you will have to deal with drugs or alcohol, but in reality, it's like this is my addictive behaviors. That's what that real problem is. You, mm. your personality. That you chose <clears throat> alcohol, drugs, or gambling, that's irrelevant. But those, those sort of behaviors are the pain of your day addiction. Sure, right. Whatever, everything else is like, yeah, that's, that's what you do to, to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, well, the whole, well, yeah, so you're conflating one and two. So um, what, what I'm saying is that the addiction is caused, uh, is, is created as an attempt to manage an underlying pain. And um, it's just literally distraction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. So, good. Uh, so, what, do we, so how, what does this mean in practical terms? 
Well, actually, we'll get to the practical at the bottom of the slide. That's a, a bad heading for that. Um, at the top are multiple selves, and I've covered that um, in other, uh, many other seminar series on the fact that we are the self. The proper way to think about this is a collection, probably a loose collection, of different parts. And one of those parts is a true self. That, and um, in the 12 step literature, that's often referred to as the higher self, and I'll get to that later on. But we have these different selves the original self, false selves, true self, and you're, that you are becoming more of. And um, these, this way of looking at the multiplicity of the parts in yourself is one of the assumptions of transform, transformative religious experiences. And the uh, using or the externalized coping strategy. What, when you go to that object, it triggers a subpersonality. A lot like Jekyll and Hyde, that's the standard or the traditional example. Or I like Hulk and Banner because I'm a Marvel fan. <laughs> Hulk and Banner. And another way to look at it, I've been using as examples of how to control your masculine energy in productive ways, is um, the Hulk and Scarlett Johansson character. Black Widow? Scarlet Widow? Black Widow. Uh, and their dynamic of how she calms him down with her feminine energy and that you can actually, within the individual, and eventually I think Hulk is, now I'm dating this video, Hulk is going to become the Dr. Hulk, I'm excited to see that, uh, where he integrates those two parts of his personality. But many men are uh, imbalanced because they've either gone too Hulk or too Banner. And of course, there are many other parts in, within you, and I've, I've covered that. If you want to see that in the free videos, is uh, the lecture series, The Practical Psychology of Extraordinary Living. And the last two videos specifically are, are on IFS therapy and exploration of true selves. And in my courses in Lifestyle Mastery, there's an entire multi-hour uh, module on the true self. Um, and of course, I've got a whole other course called The True Self that's also in Freedom You. And the phrase, one day at a time, that's the practical part of it, is that it's a process of becoming. It's a process of growing into, and it's not just a night or day immediate conversion experience. It's a process. And in fact, it's a 12-step process that needs to be revisited over and over because your life continues through time, and, and if you don't maintain it and grow, you're dying, right? You're plateauing and then going backwards. So it's, instead of thinking, oh man, I gotta just be free of everything, one great way of, of dealing with that kind of stress and the impossibility of the whole thing is to just focus on the next step. One step at a time. Just put one foot in front of the other, one day at a time. If, and, and if you ever just fall, it's the same thing. One step at a time. Just get back up and get back on that horse and move forward one more step. Okay, so for reflection for step one, here's some questions you can ask yourself to see whether you understand step one. If I could, do you ever ask yourself, if I could just get X, then I'd be enough. Or then I'd be fine. Then I'd be okay. Then everything would be all right. What's that X for you? Or what are they? Might be many things. For me, that thing that, because for, for me, uh, 12, 15 years ago, it was um, getting a certain skill set with women. And that became a multi year process of, that became eventually obsessive and unhealthy. And then after that, it was, it became uh, achieving a certain level of income um, and being free of my day job. And um, that was more of a night and day thing, but it did take a long time to set up. Uh, and, then, and then the scary moment when I pulled the plug on that and turned out everything turned out all right. But then it was growing to a certain level. And then it was getting a certain type of lifestyle and obsessing over that. And then thinking, if I just got that, then everything would be taken care of. And then after a few months of that, it's like, okay, what's the next thing? And usually once you attain it, there's a little excitement just because you got it. But then it wears off. What's that X for you? There might be multiple Xs at the same time, which would cause a lot of stress. What pain or fear do you have? If I never get X, what are you afraid of? How has this fear harmed your important relationships? Um, I'll put it in the first person. Has this fear harmed my respect or reputation? Has this fear caused any type of illness? Do I turn to the type of people who enable me in this behavior? And again, like just like with any overt addiction, even like the long form con addiction, which is what we're really talking about here for, for the most part, um, is and you'll notice that people in that long-form con situation surround themselves with other people who support that. So there's that limiting belief that is reinforced by your peer group that this is normal, 
or that there's no other way for it to be, right? Like, and you can see in the, in the assumptions of their questions that they post on in, in our groups that we manage, like the Man Up group, or, or that you might be asking me is, you know, like, isn't it normal though to have that feeling when she does this? No, it's probably not. But everyone you know, all the dudes you know do. And uh, that's because for you to stay in this uh, type of thinking would have required that you have that reinforced and conditioned in you by your peer group, which is probably the second or uh, maybe even the first most important factor in your uh, thinking. Have the people who care about me most objected to any compulsive behavior in getting X? And of course, you have to use your judgment there as with all things, uh, but have you seen that as happening a lot? That might be evidence for you to go deeper. What have I done in the past to try to fix, control, or change this area of my life? What have I done so far? And what's been the effect of that? What are the feelings, emotions, and conditions that I've tried to alter or control with this behavior? Am I willing to do whatever it takes to heal or transform? Okay, then we get into step two. Step two in the AA book is worded thus, thusly, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Russell Brand's interpretation, could you not be fucked? <laughs> and I think um, step two has tripped up a lot of modern people. A higher force, a higher power, even in traditional AA, was um, understood as any force that is loving, caring, or more powerful than you alone. And that could be just a group of people. It could be your uh, loving circle. Uh, it could also be your true self. And if you've done the true self course with me or the Freedom You module on the true self, you would have experienced the higher power in you. Or at the San Francisco live event we did last weekend, we started with that guided meditation on discovering the true self in you, that higher power inside you and encountering that. So you can actually directly encounter that in you. But uh, in case you haven't gotten my true self course, shame on you, or freedom you, why not? Um, <laughs> then you can just understand it however you like, a force that's loving, caring, and more powerful than you are alone. So in other words, you have to rely on something outside of yourself. That's one of the, um, the major obstacles and major sticking points, the major mistakes people make is that they think they can go, on, go it alone. The nitty-gritty problems of real life are where the work happens. And uh, I could then do another uh, whole entire graduate course just on that bullet point uh, because in Chinese philosophy, that's a major theme that the, the scholar who sits at a study staring at the bamboo trees all day, contemplating the meaning of life, knows nothing of life. That you will only know whether you are, in fact, a moral human being if you go out there and, have, and get tested. So you might understand the principle of being good but you don't know it at the deep level that really counts, what they call real knowledge or true knowledge in Chinese, until you go out and try to apply it in the real world, where you go and face problems, other people, and they test you. And then you find out, I, didn't, I know it theoretically, which is almost useless, any intelligent person can know it theoretically, I need to experience this and get a mastery over this skill and facility over myself and so on. And that's the knowledge that really matters. That's a different type of knowing. And it's the same here. If you just read the book, but you don't apply it in your life, it's like watching um, somebody do an ab workout and thinking you're going to get a six-pack out of that. You actually have to do the workout. You have to do the exercise. You have to apply it. The application of it is where you falter. So a, lot of, a very common thing is, oh, I read the self-help book. I feel so holy and great. And then somebody just annoys you. Maybe while you're reading it, like, fuck, you stop that. And then you're like, oh, uh, it's supposed to be all peaceful and calm. And then you just like, one step at a time, all right, get back on there, apologize or whatever it is. And admittedly, this is, this is where it gets hard. Um, but you just do your best, right? Tony Horton's phrase, do your best, forget the rest. I love that one. Step two, reflection questions um, to see if you understand the material and to get you to reflect further into it. Do I commit to change? This is the part where you're like, all right, I'm going to move forward. Do I accept that change means I must be different in some way, think, feel, or act differently, that the current patterns that I've adopted are not optimal? What is my conception of a power greater than me? Do I know people who have engaged with a new power and transformed their lives in a revolutionary and radical way? thus finding new peace and purpose. Is this what I want? Again, asking you to commit over and over here. Is this how my life is now, or am I struggling with relationships or emotions? Again, just 
different ways of asking that earlier question. Could my compulsive impulse be applied to something healthier and thus could be seen as a misdirection of a positive intent if I look at it differently? In fact, I have a whole positive intent module in guided meditation, Insight Freedom U. So if you haven't gotten that, what the heck are you doing? Join the Freedom U course. And it actually helps you to encounter the positive intents of your various parts that are just being misused. You put those players in the wrong positions in your life, and it's like putting the linebacker in the running back position, and you keep throwing the ball to him, and he's just tired. Um, but he just keeps being forced into that position. Or he took on that position because the running back, or the, the, the wide receiver, I'm sorry, the wide receiver just decided to take a nap or something. And now he's getting used to that. Um, is there, was there a positive intent behind that part that was using? And we'll get into that uh, hopefully in these slides later. Um, and you'll see that uh, there was just there was a, a way of that that part was trying to manage or protect you from facing those fears, which is a positive thing. So if you just hate yourself further, like fuck, I wish I wasn't an addict. Fuck, I fuck, right? And you just, you're adding toxicity to the system instead of appreciating it and freeing it and liberating it and realizing you are trying to help me. Let's see what if I could retire you for a while, what you would morph into. And whenever you relieve that part of those toxic duties, you'll find that that part, which is already a big part of you, uh, attains joy and um, effortlessness with some other area. Uh, can I connect to this love within me that I sometimes misdirect? Can I connect to this greater power that I see elsewhere in life? So I personally think that the best way for an average modern atheist to think about a higher power is that there's a part of you that knows what you ought to do, that you need to tune into that part more, you need to give rein to that part more, and try to inhabit that part more, or let that part inhabit you more. Um, that At least the acknowledgement that that exists in you. And again, if you haven't experienced this part of you, I have a like 10 to 15 minute uh, meditation in True Self and the Freedom You Live, uh, Freedom You online course. Okay, um, there's a lot more to be said here. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. So the way we talk about step two is it can literally be anything except you. Oh, right. It cannot be you because yeah. you need control, control of the same things. Yeah, yeah. So there's that part that says you can't rely on yourself. Because, uh, oh yeah, thank you, Vince. So in day-to-day -day life, like so for the long-form con, this can often take the form of, I'll just watch more YouTube videos, and then I'll unfuck myself. Right? <laughs> or, you know, I'll just use willpower, I'll just put a timer on my phone, I'll literally lock up the food. Um, I got a system. Um, but if it's an addictive cycle that you've used this external object to cope with your pain or un unwanted emotions, uh, that will only work for a short period of time if ever. Right? And maybe you've experienced that, like you've tried to do it the hard way on your own and to get yourself out of reliance on yourself. So in fact, if you're in this, um, so we're all, so one of the things I say about the true self is that almost everybody is alienated from the true self, from your higher power in you. And you're very, very rarely uh, living in that energy, living in that part of that self in you. And um, it's, it's good to acknowledge that that's there, but it's almost, it's, you're so alienated from it that it feels like it's a, different, it's a different thing. It's a different part of you. And in fact, the way that we lead you into that, um, and this is a, an, a timeless, well, not time, it's an age-old meditation from uh, Buddhism and uh, ancient Indian traditions, as well as ancient Chinese traditions, is to imagine some higher power. Buddha could be the Christ figure, whatever that is for you. <clears throat> and to have that power come to you and tell you how to handle the situation and, and then to show you. And then the question at the end is, uh, well, where did that come from? Where did that knowing how that higher power would do it come from? Even in prayer, right? If you're a modern atheist, you don't believe that there's a God, like some ethereal being out there in the universe that created everything. And yet you can pray. And you, while you're praying, you can speak to somebody else, this greater power that you imagine. And it can say stuff to you or maybe give you an answer to something. Or it might just be a phrase like, just relax, just like, oh, it could be something like that that you might discover in meditation. And there's like, sort of like modern atheistic prayers. Well, where did that voice come from? You might then go religious and believe in there, that there's some other externalized higher power. And you know, my entire family almost, uh, I'm pretty sure all of them believe in something like that. And I used to, too. So I don't think it's completely irrational. Uh, I just don't happen, I happen to not think. Think of that. I have to think that that is not where the preponderance of evidence leans. So the 
uh, naturalistic answer is it was somewhere in you already. And then there is actual evidence for there being a true self in your brain. That there's an executive function in the brain that if you were that you could access, but that it takes some it takes quite a bit of guidance and training to get there. Because almost all of your life you've been inhabiting a part, a secondary part, that is overused. Okay, so we're only on step two. I gotta keep powering forward. Um, I hope to be on step five by this point, but so let's just keep going. Uh, let's get to step three. And thank you for, um, for those insights. Step three, uh, right out of the AA book, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Why is this always in the past tense? Is this like how we shared, we shared this is how we did it? Is that? Well, do you know? Hmm. It's really to emphasize that it can be absolutely oh. anything. It, they did, right. do write it with a capital G in the AA's book for some reason, well, because they let go back in the 1930s. Yeah. Uh, but it's really the same as that. It can be exact, exactly whatever you want. Because this is the biggest hurdle for everyone entering a 12 step group. Right. Of a higher power of God. Yeah. So it's like, it's whatever you want, then. Yeah. Could it be like yeah. this cup? So it's always, <laughs> it's always written there, literally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah whatever you want. Like an anonymous job. It's like a fucking ashtray. Mmm, right. Yeah. As long as you impute the qualities of loving, caring, more powerful than you. Right. Um, and I think also that it's in past tense because they want to emphasize not only that they're sharing what they've done, but that it can be done. So it's been done before. So Brad's interpretation, I love these. Are you on your own going to unfuck yourself? <laughs> Are you on your own going to unfuck yourself? So the first step, well, one of the main, main steps, early steps, is to appreciate that part of you that helped you cope that made being bearable, that kept you alive. It had positive intent. And I love this little passage or like a story in Brand's book where his therapist or counselor told him, um, congratulations on being a drug addict because you stayed alive. Because being that way, that's how you, that's how you dealt with being you. So you have to appreciate that part of you. Otherwise, you're just adding more toxicity into it. And again, I have a whole process for uh, appreciating your parts, positive intents, and freedom you. Okay, ask for help. Step three means we ask for help. When you are anxious, fearful, overwhelmed, etc., you no longer just plow on. And I've, I've done so many DTPHD podcasts on this theme that the over-reliance on discipline and willpower is, especially now as a corrective to the discourse around toxic masculinity and how far how more, much more, too, too extreme that's gone. And then the men pushing back with getting, going deeper into a toxic kind of masculinity, which is an over-reliance on the discipline. Just plowing on, fuck your emotions. Your emotions are irrelevant and illegitimate. Just get the fucking job done. Wake up early, you piece of shit, and get the fucking job done. I don't care how you feel. I'm gonna slap you in the face so you can fucking toughen up. All right, so we're actually all, and of course I grew up with that energy. Um, I actually doubled down on it much more than my parents. I now, as I get older, realize that they weren't as tough on me as I thought I was. I just internalized those voices and um, turned the volume up on those. <laughs> they were a lot softer and forgiving than I uh, thought they were uh, when I first started therapy. But that has resulted in all kinds of good things as achievers. That's often how we achieve. Um, but it's also an addictive cycle. Instead, as you enter into the 12 steps and as you look for a better way of achieving, you pause. Instead of just plowing forward, you stop. And this pausing is really fucking hard. Because if you couldn't plow forward, often what will happen is you use. You use whatever that pornography for a lot of dudes. Just want to release some tension, right? And just like, oh, it doesn't harm anything, you know? And, or whatever it is. It could be just be any, anything. However you relieve tension. It could be you go to grab a beer um, one too many times. Or that you continue to use that. And... Um, when you read about the stories of addicts, so one of the great things about the AA book, and I think one of the reasons why it's the most successful self-help book in modern history, is that it starts with the story. The first chapter or introduction, the first thing you read, is a detailed uh, description of like a narrative of how one guy just spiraled down into his drug, into his alcohol um, addiction. And... Uh, it just kept getting worse and worse. And then there kept, there, he kept coming up, up with rationalizations for it uh, instead of pausing. So uh, Brand shared a story of, of uh, a woman who, who her whole goal 
as a teenager and adult was to get auditions to get into this great acting school. And then when she got the great act, got into the great acting school, it was to get the next, uh, the next gig, or whatever. So every time, the night before the big audition, she'd use and disappear for like two weeks. Like, you got this part. She, everyone would be supporting her, her whole network, They'd be really into it. And then suddenly she just disappeared. Nothing on tech, she wouldn't show up. Or like two or three of these down the road, she does show up, but she's wasted. You know? And it, then when he, they asked her, like, how did you, like, what happened? She explained that, well, to deal with the stress, she had some ice cream. And then she's like, fuck, if I'm having ice cream, which is such a low level addiction, you know, I might as well just, do it for real. And then she would just walk down the street just to get a little hit. And then on the way, she's like, she, she needed to score and she helped some other people score. And then, and then that led to, you know, down the spot. And then disappeared with the shame and all that. And then it happened over and over. What you need to do instead of just reacting is to do nothing for a while, to pause. And one of the meditations I want to uh, end off with before lunch is, is, an endure, is this meditation that's called When You Endure. When you must endure. Just, just hang there when it's really difficult. You know, like for a lot of you guys, like maybe one analogy that you could understand immediately is fitness. Right? So if, you have ever, if you've ever held, if you, have you ever done those, uh, a movement where you're supposed to hold at the peak for two seconds or like you do a tension workout? So you, like for, for me, it's the dumbbell flies and you, you hold at the bottom. You count for two seconds. It could also be like the shrugs for me too. Like you do 12 and then you hold at the top for 15 seconds. And you feel the burn and you just hold it, hold it. And it sucks, but that's where the growth is. The growth isn't in the first 10 reps or whatever it is, you know, the early part of that set. It's at the end. And then you're going to go even extra, right, those tension reps. That's a really crude analogy for what it's feeling like. This is the most painful part, and your natural reaction is to drop the weight. The natural reaction is to just push it back up. It's to do something. Don't do anything. Just hold. Just pause for a while. Yes. So if pausing in the context of addition, would it be just don't do this right now? You want it to do it, just delay it, just don't do it? Or what's or that separate? So, okay, so there are, at the early stages of, of anything where you're trying to replace a bad habit with a new habit, you could probably just create the conditions where you, you can't um, access those things. And so you want to replace that. So maybe with... Um, uh, people who are addicted to smoking, there's just that physical habit of going this way. And so you pick up some other object or you replace them. There's all kinds of ways of tricking the brain. Uh, but if you want to attack it directly, and eventually you will have to do it, is to feel the tension. Like, okay, I really want to use this. Now, pause. That's the crucial time. That's the therapeutic time. So if you can actually pause and then magically beam your therapist right in front of you, that's where you explore Where's the pain? Because that's, that's when you're actually feeling the pain. So in therapy, there's a skill to making the most of your therapeutic sessions where you can access that pain quicker. So the longer it takes you to go there, the more time you're wasting in therapy. Uh, I think we talked about this earlier. Like if you're just talking theoretically about stuff, it's, a, it's really a waste of therapy time. Therapy is to get to the pain. The faster you can get to the pain because that's the underlying problem. Now the tension is right where that point of your life that meets the pain. It's right there. How do you, and it's coming up. It's threatening to come up. So what you do is you go to the coping strategy. You go to the drinks or the alcohol or the pornography or whatever it is to relieve that tension. That tension is the working point. That's where you need to go, whoa, what's that pain? And then follow it backwards. In fact, a lot of the meditations in the therapeutic courses that I do are to get you back to those points of pain. And when you feel them and they're not like overwhelming, then you can float out of them and see what was happening, like trace them back to a memory. And then that memory is attached to a pain. And then to find out what decision you made at that point in, that, in your life that is still causing you pain. Some interpretation of what that meant. And so on. That point of tension is the, is the gold like that you've been digging for. Most of the time it's just so down beneath, beneath the surface because, well, you're just having some dinner with your friends or whatever and you're just keeping it up here. And it never comes up. When you're really stressed, when you're really pain, uh, in pain, or like when you lash out at somebody, you're like, whoa, whoa. That for me is like one of my pain points. Like, oh, shit. Oh, hmm. Something there. I better go retreat to my meditation cave and explore that. Where's that tension? Let's go deeper. What am I missing? Where's the, where's the, first of all, where's the feeling? You attune to the feeling. And um, you go deeper into it. You expand it. You exaggerate it so that you feel it in the moment. And then that can help you jog your memory back to the traumatic 
point in your life. And then you can, then you can do the therapeutic work. The self-therapy is really difficult. It's not actually the way it should be done. And we'll get to that into the next steps. You need to have somebody else see you. Uh, because when you were a child, you tried to deal with that yourself. And it didn't work in the dark of night, in your bedroom at night, or in your closet, or whatever you ran when you were hurt. Um, you couldn't handle it. It wasn't, you weren't enough on your own to be able to do that. So just having even somebody else listen to you, not say anything, just sort of take it in and see you and not judge you. And even just that in itself is that extra uh, amount of um, impetus that will take you to the next level. We'll come back to this point, actually, as we go further. So the idea is to become comfortable with the uncomfortable. You endure just a moment longer. You become master of your wilderness of discomfort. That's a, a phrase I borrowed from Sarah Blondin. The wilderness of discomfort. Get used to that. Because while you're coming out of this cycle that you've been using for years or decades, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be dis- there's going to be a lot of tension and discomfort. And uh, you're, going to, you're going to be lashing out in ways that you didn't expect because you're not getting to use the way that you normally use, the way that you normally cope. So your unconscious mind is trying to deal with attention in new ways. And often it will just like randomly go to other things that may not work. And um, uh, yeah, a lot of achievers don't realize when they're stressed until they have a breakdown. Uh, so it's just earlier, seeing that happen earlier, making the breakdowns more evident to yourself earlier, so you can go and do self-care. <clears throat> okay, eventually what you want is freedom from the cult of not enough. It's a cult because everybody here, everybody in the world, uh, at least anybody who's plugged into the modern uh, economy, and I suspect anyone else, even in tribal times, believed uh, or subscribed or belonged to the cult of not enough. The first three steps are actually just mental ascents. Like you assent to this, yes, this, yes, this, yes. <laughs> so it's just, yes, I have a problem. Yes, I could improve. Yes, I see that I will need outside help, and I accept and commit to that help. But often the first three steps are where everybody trip up. Like you can't, they don't even get the momentum. They're just like, oh, I can do this on my own. Or oh, it's not such a big problem. Or, uh, or they get lost in step two. Like, yeah, but I can't do anything about it. So this is me. This is my life. This is how my life is. I just suck compared to everybody else. And even when it comes to improving your dating, which is actually um, built on an addictive cycle, you see you encounter these, the same issues. So in, in my videos, my courses, I have to address all three of these points. Um, so uh, one of your, your uh, points yesterday, uh, one of the reasons why, especially in the beginning and ends of each module, I'm spending more time cheerleading is because of these, how difficult it is to get these into your brain, like to, for you to really see, yes, there is a problem. It's, as bad. It is a, it's a problem that needs to be a priority for me to handle. Yes, I can do this. And for a lot of guys, it's like, forget it. I can, this isn't meant for me. That's for that other guy. And then they hate on that other guy. No, it's just, you can do this. And I can't do this just on the, my own, and especially the ways I've been trying to do it. Okay, so typical life advice are, get a job, then you'll be fine. You know, get out of your basement and get a job. Or just get some exercise, man. You see that a lot in the men's groups. Like, dude, you just need to do more deadlifts. And all your problems will go away. Right? <laughs> you'll get a great body. You'll feel better. Okay. Um, get a nice girlfriend. All right, so you see, in our niche, that's a big part of it. And uh, I feel uh, when, when I, well, four or five years ago, three, especially three years ago, I made the move out of this type of messaging. And I just like going hardcore into therapy. And nobody clicked on those videos. Nobody's watching those videos. Like, I'm saying all this good stuff, but I'm not couching it in a way that will reach the intended audience. So now I'm doing, I went back to a benevolent bait and switch where I'm like, I know this is what the kind of, you know, drug that you want. This is what you respond to, you user. There it is. Follow me down this path like Hansel and Gretel, and I'll lead you to what you really need. And um, that's how I've been trying to do it. So, again, I know that, like, the, the click... Uh, the cost per click on a get a girlfriend is a lot lower than find fulfillment. I was going to 10 bucks a click on find fulfillment kind of messaging. Uh, we know we've tested. Uh, so um, anyway, this is a, a baser, more animalistic desire, which is more to the, at the forefront of your mind. Get a hobby. Have you ever seen that? Like, dude, you just need more hobbies, uh, more friends. And then, of course, consumerism comes in here. The latest mobile phone or upgrade, right? Lose a few pounds. You'll feel 
your life will be just turned around. So um, these are all well-meaning most of the time, and the, certainly they can't hurt you uh, if you have the time to pursue them, uh, generally. I don't know about the latest mobile phone thing, but most of these are not bad, but they're incomplete. And instead, the actual advice is to stop striving, let go of all of this, and look deeper. So we're constantly looking for the next x. So you, you replace one x with another. Like, if only I could I don't know, do that deadlift, or get, get a black belt in jiu-jitsu, or uh, make a million dollars, or get free from my day job, or whatever it is. Whatever that x is for you, you just keep replacing it. And that's what I meant by you, you ascend the summit, and you're like, oh, there's another summit. Now my life has meaning again. And you go down, and you ascend that summit. Now my life has meaning again, over and over and over. Uh, so um, instead, to, to look deeper. There is no lasting relief from these pursuits. They are only a distraction. And what, you're really, what you really should be aiming for is freedom, to be released from this burden of trying to prove that you're enough, trying to prove it to yourself, actually, that you're OK, that you're enough for love, all the striving. And in fact, where you're worried, the, the average or the natural achiever's worry is, but if I'm not beating myself up like a self-flagellation to get there, then I'll just be a bum, and I'll be lazy. And yes, there's a part of you that just wants to rest, isn't there? There's a part of you that just wishes that we're all over, that you didn't have to do all this, that you could just get it effortlessly. We know that there's a part of us that's, that's, that's like that. And we have not gone to visit with that part. That part's a real part in you. The playful child is probably locked up, and you probably slapped in the face a bunch of times and get, gotten really angry at, because that part led you into to doing shameful things, or bad things, or just being scolded. And as you go through therapy, you'll unlock the, the door to that closet where you locked up your little five-year-old self or seven-year-old self. And, and that five- and seven-year-old self is crying this whole time and needs to be loved and still wants ice cream. And if you get Halo Top ice cream, it's not so bad. <laughs> we can't get Halo in Asia yet. God damn it. Halo guys, please ship out to Asia. Uh, it's one of those things I love in Whole Foods. They put the number of calories in the servings. 90. Ah. Anyway, so <laughs> tangent on to things that I would like to talk about are guilt free ice cream, relatively. Or Jello. Jello. That kid in me just loves these things. And you have to self care. For so many decades, I didn't let my little child, or what I did, what I did, when I'm weak, my willpower is so low and depleted, I just go into the fridge and grab a Ben and & Jerry's and fuck me, I hated myself after. I'm like, to make up for this, I'm going to have to punish myself. I don't know if you've seen videos from me uh, seven, eight years ago. I would literally punish myself. I'd drop down to 100 push-ups, or I'd double up on the workout the next day, or I would deny myself something I was really looking forward to. So that way, I would really remember that lesson of not stalking any fucking ice cream in the fridge. Instead of, huh, let's wait here. What was that from? Why did I, oh, was I overstressed there? Well, why was I too stressed? Was I denying myself some need that was un, being unmet? Okay, let's think about that and let's feel that and then let's walk backwards into that. So um, the right thing to do is to stop. That's the pause. Stop, let go. Let go of the neurotic need to fill that tension with something, with using some kind of external object, of going somewhere, of just distracting yourself and sit with it. So the hard part in therapy is sitting with the pain. And an achiever, like what I will do, is usually like a fucking anvil on a, uh, like a bank robber. That next level of security comes crashing down like, I broke the cup. Boom. Oh, shit. Now we got another steel door to get through. And uh, my method acting coach was the first one who pointed that out explicitly. Like, we were right there, man. And then she blinked something around. And then your face changed. That, those, and then I couldn't feel it anymore. I'm like, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. Right? And I, it's like, OK, let me try to go back and try it again. And like this one emotion we had to work an entire hour for. He just had me stare at this point in the wall. And just let it out. Let that emotion out. Okay. And what did you say? And like, now turn and say it. Oh, all right. All right. So I have to get in that motion and just like forget that I'm acting. And then turn and tap me on the shoulder and I can deliver that line. And uh, it's like, okay. Now we just have to get you there faster so we don't have to waste 20 minutes of like prep to do one line. It's like, holy shit, this is hard. And you'll see there's this really great clip that I've been looking for. I should act, ask the co my coach because he sent it to me earlier and I tried to Google it many times and I keep forgetting. I should just ask him. Jack Nicholson in preparing for that Here's Johnny movie. I forget the name of it now. Just blanking you on. Here's Johnny! Like when he's psycho. Uh, what's that movie called? <clears throat> the Shining. Thank you. Yeah. So he's prepping for another take and the whole oh, the camera guys are all setting stuff up. So you see Somebody's filming it back here, and they're like setting up the, the lighting here, you know, and 
Kubrick, I think, is in there. It's like, okay. And then the girl around the corner in the bathroom, she's just screaming. The lady, she's like, ah, ah. She's just all you hear is her screaming. And Nicholson's like taking the ass, like, ah, ah. he's like killing the, the, the sofa and all. It's like, and then all the camera guys, lighting is working in the background. And then they're like, back out, like, all right, action. And then he goes right into it, ah, boom, right through the, the door. And then the person who put the clip together on YouTube um, switches right into the clip. And it's just like, damn, even a master like that in between takes, doesn't let go. He's just in it, in it, in it. Anyway, so the part of that is when you're in therapy, it might be hard for you to, to make the most of it because you're not getting there. And it might take your whole 40 minutes, 50 minutes, or it might take multiple sessions for you to get undo those layers to get deeper and deeper. Those times when you're like, oh, I should just go and just jack off to some porn or whatever. I know it's a, a common example among 20-year-old guys. Stay there. Don't do that. And feel it. Feel the tension of like you, you want to go and do that, that this or, or this or whatever it is. Feel that tension. And then take a step back and, and try. Um, but I, I understand if at the beginning you need to replace it with something else. Um, but the real work happens when you can pause. Step three, reflection. Am I feeling down, empty, depressed, or anxious? Do my feelings lead to decisions or actions or things I regret? Is it becoming clear that my old pattern isn't working? Is it clear that I need a new plan for fulfillment? Am I open to a different plan? Am I open to being guided? Welcome back. So we, before the break, covered steps one to three of the 12-step program. Uh, and I'm using the AA Big Book as our guide here, our signposts, as well as Russell Brand's interpretations of each of those, which are really fun. And uh, here we're on step four. Step four is we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Brand's interpretation is write down all the things that are fucking you up or have ever fucked you up and don't lie or leave anything out. The inventory. And this is to assess, the purpose of this is to assess and, uh, and understand the complex interconnecting beliefs and feelings and thoughts uh, and behaviors that, oh, well, that undergird your behaviors, patterns, and habits. This is actually a Christian or Catholic uh, philosophy of action <laughs> that beliefs and feelings lead to behaviors. But they can also go the other way around. You get into a pattern of unthinking behavior and it engenders thoughts or triggers thoughts and feelings. To see, and eventually to, the point is to see that the compulsive behavior is a symptom of a deeper problem. So the inventory is to help you spot the bigger patterns. Um, what are the things you're trying to avoid? When is it happening? What is in common in those events or those triggers? <clears throat> and then try to look deeper. This is, um, well, let's just, there, this is a multi-step reflection, which we'll, I'm gonna use to explain what step four actually means. One way of looking at this is based in uh, a look at vir um, virtue and vice theory. And here we have the seven roots of psychological pain. So the first one is pride, which is how I think others view me. This is one of the most common these days. Self-esteem, how I view myself. Ambitions, my overall vision of my perfect self, or my ideal self. Interpersonal relations, the script I run with others and what those would mean. Uh, sexual relations, as above pertaining to sex. Security, what I need to survive. And finances, how money or the accumulation of resources affects my emotions. So these categories, we follow them back. That usually your psychological pain would fall under one of these seven categories. You can trace it to one of these seven roots. So this is a helpful way to think about what's underlying your destructive behaviors or the neurotic patterns. Another way is to look at um, story as an element in it. Our character, the virtues or vices that we have, is the result of the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. And in fact, this is such an important theme and concept, the idea of story, that we covered it in San Francisco at the Freedom U Live event. We also have a big section on it in Freedom U Online and in Lifestyle Mastery. Your story and what the story you've been telling yourself about life or about your part in the universe and what things that happen to you mean. And unless you rewrite those or see them in new ways, you're going to get stuck in the old story that you keep telling yourself, like a, like a hypnotic trance. Taking an inventory, taking uh, an inventory breaks down the hidden and destructive operating system that we're unconsciously running. So the, I've used this analogy for years, the idea that there's something, uh, that there are these scripts 
<clears throat> limiting beliefs, uh, patterns of thought that lead to behavior or that are triggered by behavior that leads to thoughts, the, the, this interlocking pattern of thoughts, behavior, and beliefs, and emotions that keep you stuck in the current state. And it's like an operating system with malicious code that you don't know about, but that's just freezing your computer and giving you the spinning wheel of doom. And every time you have to reboot the thing. And the rebooting of the computer uh, is that coping strategy. That's, why, that's the way you cope when you have a, too many viruses on your computer, just shut the thing down. And that's actually a, a way that I, that I think is helpful of thinking about the addip, addictive behaviors, where you just reboot it in a way by just, let's, well, might as well just start over. Let's just get another drink or whatever it is. Um, that's your way of coping with, ah! instead of trying to find that code and rewriting it so you don't keep freezing. Okay, so it's an analogy. Here are some inventory questions for your step four. Um, accept the world as it is, but see that we can change ourselves. So instead of blaming others or getting stuck in that pattern and trying to change external things, it's actually inside. So it's a point we've been making that the object itself is not bad. And you can ask yourself, where did I make a mistake or where was I wrong? Where have I been, where have I been selfish? Where, have I, uh, where was I dishonest? Where was I self-centered? Where was I fearful? Where am I to blame? What faulty characteristics did I display back then or have I displayed? Just take an inventory of all the faults that you've, you've made and, and um, places that you've uh, failed. And that is the step four. Okay, I've resolved to go quicker through this, so I'm just gonna, if you've got questions, write them down. You can always raise your hand, shoot your hand up. Step five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Brand's interpretation. Honestly, tell someone trustworthy about how fucked you are. <laughs> okay, so then I would launch into a long excursus about the power of confession. I'm going to make it really short. Uh, Freud and Jung understood this. Of course, there's the famous book, uh, Confessions, uh, Augustine, and you have that throughout the Catholic tradition. Uh, you can also explore, I'm waiting for a scholar in, in Asian philosophy to explore confession in that tradition, but that exists as well. And more recently, Freud and Jung and the inventors of psychotherapy, or the founders of psychotherapy as a practice, psychoanal psych psychoanalytics, also clearly understood the power of confessing um, in a private setting where it's confidential and you feel like you can open up and um, that you trust the other person. And just the offloading of that um, pain and the shame and guilt and being seen as you do that. Uh, that's a big part of it, being seen. Uh, and to have as a constant reminder that these untreated neuroses will lead to self-destruction and that our feelings of despair are not unique to you and are also temporary. So having that connection with another human being, either in therapy or as a, in counseling, or in a group setting that is anonymous, provides you with that, that it reminds you that this is something that you have in common with other people. It's not just you who's going through this, and that others have made it out. And that if you don't continue on this path of, of transformation, your, your, your life is going to end up um, self-destructing or with a life of regret. It's this constant reminder not to battle it alone. Yes? Sure. Step five is really important, especially if you're doing the long con. Mm. Uh, you've been so used to self-deceiving yourself, you're most probably not going to see everything that's wrong with you, except another, another person asking those extra 10 questions to poke a little mm. bit more, then a lot more will show up and you will see some patterns that you guarantee you would not see on your own. Yeah. Yeah, great point. Yeah. Yeah, it's the long form con to get into that, it's been such a long period of time of, of adopting that pattern that you, you have all these blind spots. The hard part is also to have the humility to respond, like to, to take in those uh, opinions or those criticisms, maybe you might see those as uh, advice to take in that advice. <clears throat> Great, so reflection here. Can I set aside my ego? Am I open to a new truth? Right, so the other human being will tell you. Also, when you confess, you're saying all these bad things that you've done in the past, and that will naturally lead, if you're not a psychopath, to some kind of guilt. And hopefully, because you're now revealing it to somebody else, and you're working through it, you can undo the shame that was associated with it. 
Can I set aside my ego? Am I open to a new truth? Am I willing to take responsibility for myself? Am I willing to be vulnerable with another person? Okay. The person that you confess to or that you find as a mentor or sponsor or the group that you, find, that you look for um, should have a leader in it who has sufficient life experience, who's been through something like that, who that is somebody that you respect and trust and somebody that you don't expect anything else from. So they're just there to listen to you and, and to, like, to see you, to, um, to take your confession. You're not expecting them to do anything else with it or to like, hold up their end of the contract or whatever it is. Okay, that's step five. Then we move on to step six. All right, I think I can do this. <laughs> step six, we, are, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Russell Brand's interpretation is, well, that's revealed a lot of fucked up patterns. Do you want to stop it? Seriously? All right, so this is <clears throat> where you make that commitment, that resolve. I will really do this. Okay, go right to the reflection here. Why do I do this? How does it help me? What am I getting or avoiding? by indulging in these behavior patterns, overeating, overworking, um, distracting myself with uh, online entertainment of some kind. If I do not change, what will happen? If I am willing to change, how could my life improve? Do I want this pattern removed? Am I ready to let it go? How is my life going to be unmanage unmanageable because of my powerlessness to change? And the best way to do this my opinion, is to get Scrooged. What does that mean? For those who've been through Invincible and in Drive, Invincible Module 5, and in Drive, which is also part of Freedom U online, you know what that means. A very powerful Scrooge process where you go through these exact questions and a lot more um, through an emotional process that is embodied. In other words, you're using your face, your voice, and your body to get into that emotional state, so it's that much more powerful. You could just sit there and reflect and write. Like if you just sit there and reflect literally just in, thin, in, um, in just blank air, or thin air, out of thin air, and just sit there, oh, what would happen? Uh, that's going to give you 10% of that power. If you write it down, it might give you 30 to 40% of that power. If you feel it and emotionally experience it with music, with movement, and you get yourself there to like, if I don't change, what will happen? If, and then you say it to yourself and you really get into it, deep into it, um, you, know, you get 80 to 90% or 100% of that power. So um, this is called the Scrooge process because Ebenezer Scrooge went through that right in the Christmas tale. All right, so Invincible and Drive. So, there's a little plug for a couple of my courses that you all have access to. All right, so um, there you go. Am I willing to let go of my self-centered, ego-driven point of view? Am I willing to stop blaming others and to let go of resentment? These are really deep. I should really be pausing at each of these. Brennan Brown's written entire books just on the second bullet point. Brene Brown? Brene Brown, yeah. Am I willing to let go of my old plan and adopt a new plan for my life? Am I willing to accept there are more powerful forces than I and that I cannot do this on my own? Okay, and then we move on to step seven. We humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Brand's interpretation, are you willing to live in a new way that's not all about you and your previous fucked up stuff? Because you have to. And this thing I mentioned earlier about humility, humility, you must have the humility to acknowledge your relative insignificance, but not your worthlessness. So this is uh, an important point to make for those deep thinkers among you about the idea that you are enough. So I have to first put that plain common sense caveat that you're that when we, speak, when we speak about the fact that you're worthy or that you're enough, it's that you're worthy or enough to be loved, for love, right? That to not die. So those, that's the context. It's not that you're worthy of an Olympic gold medal or that you're worthy of some other thing. You have to go and earn that. But when you were born, you, you, didn't have to, you don't need to do anything more than exist for you to be worthy of love. And, and you may not be worthy of love from that person or that person, but you're worthy of love and at the very least uh, from yourself. And this is what makes you um, um, have worth, right? This is, this is uh, just being human, just being part of you, just being alive. But you're actually, if you look at it, so you ever seen those um, NASA or uh, those astronomy things where you start with your town or whatever, and then you, you zoom out to the Earth and then to your solar system and then to the greater universe and just keeps going bigger and bigger and bigger. And you find out, out of all the known space, right, our universe is this little speck 
And then just the whole idea. So like, also one of the great things about it is it shows you that all these things that you think are like life and death and really big deal um, are like, that's just space, right? We're not even going in time. But just in terms of space, that is insignificant. I mean, it's like just a little blip. And then in terms of time, it's the same. And that you should take some kind of comfort from that. Unless you're a narcissist or psychopath and you're like, fuck, I wish my name was writ large like Thanos on the universe. Ah. Right? And I've encountered quite a lot of people who are like that and I try to cut them out of my life because they are scary. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I actually got close to a lot of those types of people and I didn't find out until I became a wiser person that that was the case. <clears throat> but uh, I've met a lot of our cultures in history have valorized people like that. Like Achilles, for instance. I love how they started that movie, Troy, and he's in this tent with two naked women. He gets roused by some boy who was sent, a boy servant sent to him, and the boy servant says, uh, that man is so big, I, don't, I wouldn't fight him. And then Brad Pitt's on there like, that's why no one will remember your name. <laughs> okay. So Achilles was all about legacy. Like, what are they going to say about me 2,000 years from now? And indeed, we do still talk about Achilles, uh, yet he is no longer around to uh, enjoy that. Unless you believe in an afterlife and he's up there like, yeah, they're still talking about me right there in San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> and he gets this narcissistic supply from it. But it, we should take comfort in the fact that everything's, that we are insignificant because your mistakes also aren't going to haunt you for the rest of history. And also the great things that you do aren't that big of a deal either. And to just let all that shit go, because it actually doesn't really matter. What really matters is the fact that what has worth is the fact that you have whatever time you have on this earth, 50 years, 100 years, or however long, and that you can enjoy this time, and that you make the most of that. And uh, it, to stop comparing yourself, because that's really what legacy will end up forcing you to do. It will, cr will create a narcissistic personality disorder in you if you didn't have it already. We are already and always working a program. For most of us, though, it is an unconscious program. It's what I refer to as your operating system. And that if you, so the, the saying in the anonymous groups is, if you're not working a program, a program is working you. And that's something I, I stumbled upon even before I understood where it came upon anonymous. I just, I just talked about it as an operating system. There is an operating system running your CPU or whatever, your you. <laughs> and it was written by somebody else or it was written by a really bad coder when you were young that just piece by piece, like just wrote random stuff in there and at various times in your life. And it's conflicting all the time now. And now through therapy, through these therapeutic processes, through this transformative, transformative process, you get to go back and revisit those parts that are breaking everything down and rewrite them. Okay, step seven reflection is really short. What do I want to change? Am I going to change those things? Do I commit to change? Step eight. We made a list of all persons we had harmed and become, uh, became willing to make amends to them all. Brand's interpretation. Prepare to apologize to everyone for everything affected by your being so fucked up. And he throws in, and I, I, this is a good time to remind everybody of the difference between shame and guilt. <clears throat> shame is about the person that you are bad. Shame is about who you are. Versus guilt, which is about what you've done, the things that your behavior or, or anything that you can ex externalize. Um, guilt is helpful. Guilt can be very good and transformative. There can also be a healthy shame, which I think really just comes down to guilt. So in other, so in other words, when your conscience tells you you shouldn't have done that, that's not who you are at your best, right? Then you have healthy shame, like, shit, I shouldn't have run over that kid when I was drunk. That's good shame. Like, oh, I feel so shame. Good. Piece of shit, right? Um, okay, so there can be healthy shame. So that's why I always want to say toxic shame. But I think that's really guilt. Anyway, philosophically, we can, we can quibble there. But um, it's, it's not about who you are and that you can't change who you are, right? That's toxic shame. So when we, we parents shame kids all the time. Like, you're a bad boy, Johnny. And then Johnny will end up repeating to himself because his brain is very malleable at that age. I'm a bad boy. Or I'm not a bad boy. I'm not a bad boy because he's fighting it. Not, eventually, he'd be like, I'm a bad boy. And he doesn't want to be a bad boy because that's going to say a lot of bad things about himself. And he just hates himself for being a bad boy. So he shuts the bad boy self, whatever he did, into that little corner, locks the door, throws the key away. And then he adapts into a pleaser of some kind to please mommy or daddy, whoever shamed him. 
And now that little boy, who was probably just playing very innocently before being shamed, is now locked up forever. And that part of you that also dies with that boy, the playfulness, the creativity, the exploration, the adventure, whatever that was, or maybe even the sexuality associated with exploring your genitals or whatever, gets locked up forever. And now you just weighed down with toxic shame of sex, especially sexual shame, which is very common even in the West. And that's because those parts of you that had healthy, uh, healthy attitude towards your sexuality were locked up, were shamed. Because that's not a way that you are allowed to be. All right, so that's shame. So there's a lot of shame associated with addictive cycles. And unless you can undo that, you're not going anywhere. And that's why in Rock Solid Relationships, Mask and Mastery, um, uh, modules three to seven, we have a shame sequence. Of course, I don't call it that because it sounds weird, but that's what we do. I start with educating you about the theory of shame, and then at each module, we get into deep therapeutic guided meditations. All right, so if you want to directly address that, you can do it with your therapist, and that will take weeks and weeks of weekly sessions, or, and or you could um, get rock-solid relationships, which you all have access to. We also do this undoing of shame in Freedom U. Actually, in Freedom U Online, we go even deeper than in Rock Solid, uh, as far as shame is concerned. So in phase A, we have very advanced uh, therapeutic uh, exercises. So here's the step, a, uh, step eight reflection. Take an inventory of each person that you have affected. What you, uh, and then write down what you did that was harmful, what you should have done instead, and who suffered as a result, and how. Keep it simple. Don't like overanalyze it. Don't psychoanalyze the other person. Just keep it simple and take this inventory. Now, the other person that you're with, your sponsor or your mentor or your counselor, the person you're confessing to will also uh, be witness to all of these things. So this is their their hard job is to listen to you go through all of this. All right, step nine. <clears throat> See, I told you the rest would be faster. <laughs> step nine. We made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Brand's interpretation, now apologize, unless that would make things worse. <laughs> Love how much more simple that is. <laughs> and so the previous step was to figure out all the people you've wronged. Step nine is to now go and find those people and make amends. Um, unless you're going to make things worse. <clears throat> there is a science of coincidences. I thought this was really interesting to bring it up here. And Tony Robbins has some discussion about coincidence. There's a, I call it a science because I always thought it was weird to talk about coincidences and to like think about them and how coincidences just happen to you. You don't have to do anything for them and how mystical it is. And I'm of a scientific empirical bent and I hate things like that, mystical stuff, woohoo stuff. And I want to figure out how this is how this works. And I believe that we have things that, we have events that could be coincidences all the time, except we're not attuned to them. So you might have heard of the thing called the reticular activation system. This is just straight up normal neuroscience. And that idea being um, that the brain, that there's too many things to notice in the external world, or even in the internal world, and that your brain isn't that powerful to take it all in equally. Otherwise, you'd be Buridan's ass, and you'd be stuck you know, the donkey who's stuck between two equally desirable things and then it just starves and dies. Right. So there's too much to notice. So our brains have evolved a focusing mechanism to focus on those things that are most pertinent for our survival and replication. And we pretty much don't, we pretty much ignore the rest. So you might have heard of the famous gorilla in the mat, like the gorilla outfit walking around the background of the people passing, passing around a basketball. And so you've heard of that one, right? So watch the basketball and count how many times it gets passed. And in the meantime, the gorilla walks by, it does this, and then walks out. And like 80% of the people didn't notice that there was a gorilla. That's because you weren't focusing on that. And when it comes to coincidences, what happens is your brain starts to focus on these other things. And then you start to notice those. Like when you're in the market to buy a Tesla, suddenly you notice Tesla's all over the place. Whereas it wasn't happening before. And you wonder... Was there suddenly a lot of people in my neighborhood who just went out and bought Teslas? No. You're now noticing things that you didn't notice before. And probably coincidences, coincidences are like that. When you start to notice a lot of really cool coincidences happening to you, pay attention to those because that means your mind, your brain is working in the right direction. Of course, if you have a lot of bad coincidences, it's probably also that going to be that case. But this is going to happen a lot because what will happen is when you, in step eight, figure out who you fucked up with, and you need to make amends, even if they're really scary, like you don't want to. Step nine is you'll start to discover, oh, there are opportunities all the time. Like that person just happened to walk right up to you or happened to be at this party you totally didn't know and you haven't seen them in years and there they are. And the universe will conspire to do this for you. 
if you set the right intentions. You can also make living amends, which is to say, um, in the case where it would be detrimental to approach that person. Um, so maybe you did wrong to a woman in a relationship, or, and it would just call up all kinds of other things for her. Maybe it's a bad idea to approach her again, and apologize, or whatever it is. You can make living amends. Uh, or it could be somebody who's passed away already. You can make living amends where you do your best to live out a life that is honoring that uh, amend, right? So it would be an ongoing change in your viewpoint or your way of life. All right, so you can see how this has a lot of resonances, resonance with uh, age-old traditions, living amends. Okay, step nine, reflection. Am I willing to grow in ways I may not be aware of or in control of? Notice the theme happening in these reflections. Constantly getting you back to the point of intellectual humility to say, am I willing and open to admit I'm not, you know, I'm fucked up and I need to do things that I haven't done before to, to move forward. Am I willing to address each harm that I am aware of? Am I being completely honest with my mentor about the nature of the harm? Have I thoroughly prepared each amend with a mentor? Am I, am I willing to complete all my amends using creative solutions for individuals whom I cannot meet? Am I avoiding any of my amends? Have I made my amends a top priority in my life? Step 10, going deep here. Step 10, we continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Brand's interpretation is, watch out for fucked up thinking and behavior and be honest when it happens. I have been slipping in some Wang Yang Ming all the way through this. You didn't, probably didn't notice, but I, I must now reference him directly because Wang Yang Ming, uh, 1472 to 1529, uh, my favorite philosopher from China, uh, second most influential thinker, or maybe third most in, in Chinese history. Like a cat catching mice, be on the lookout for self-centered thoughts, because those will destroy your life. Like a cat catching mice, intently watching, always be on the lookout. That's what self-cultivation is. You think you're fine. You're like, oh, I've summited this. I've fixed this problem. I'm clean now. No, as soon as you think that, that's when you trip up. So like a cat catching mice, always be aware of it, because also, not just to to uh, um, like, it could be neurotic almost. Like, so you don't want to be neurotic because this is where you can grow when you notice these things. And in Chinese philosophy, it's that you have this principle, this li, this this thing that you've learned. Maybe you got a little grasp of this principle, this truth, and then you go out and test that truth. Maybe it's to be kind to your neighbor, or whatever it is, and you test that truth in the real world, and you find out it's a lot harder than you thought. It's a lot harder to be nice or to be nice is the wrong word to be kind or emp empathetic to somebody who is sort of a annoying you or, uh, or mean to you or rude to you. And a lot of recovering nice guys, they don't know how to, to do that. They don't know how to calibrate that. They're like, every little slight to their ego, they feel like they need to stand up and assert themselves. How dare you not look me in the eyes? Right? That's because uh, they, they haven't conquered their egos yet. Because actually the nice guy's biggest problem is his narcissism. So like a cat catching mice, you look for what the world is telling you these tension points, these failures, these mistakes, these, um, un these uncomfortable points, the wilderness of discomfort, because that is where the growth will come. Yeah. It's just literally doing step one to step in the initial process. I mean, if right. you got fucked over, you can make a man to step eight and nine. Mm, yeah. It's a whole thing, but in a short version. Yeah. Yeah, step 10 is like, like maintenance, like, like you're doing it, keep doing it. Yeah. Yes, all the time. Is that kind of like a plug for meditation then? Just that second bullet point? Or is that how it relates? Oh, uh, I think I have a slide of meditation here. Meditation will help you for the whole thing. Like, every step would be served with meditation. Do you mean watch up? Oh, you think that the thinking and behavior happens when you're sitting in meditation? No, no, no. Oh. Mean, just regular the practice of regular meditation, does that help or aid with watching? Being on the lookout for Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, almost every step, um, except maybe the one just before when you're walking up. Hey, actually, no, every step. Because emo uh, meditation will directly help you with emotional regulation and seeing the big picture and all that, of course. Yeah. Um, just as a caveat, though, here, uh, you can't watch out for fucked up thinking and behavior if you're just sitting there in meditation. So if you're sitting alone in a room, you, you might get some inner conflict there, and that's good. But you're not being tested. So that's one of the insights that Wang Yaming had. 
he was sort of like an activist philosopher. He was, he was directly counteracting Zhu Xi, which was the, the dominant ideology at the time for, thousand, for about a thousand years in, in ancient China, which took the view that you could sit in quiet, it's like called quiet sitting, where you sit quietly and meditate about the truths of the world. But that's not going to make you a better person. You only become a better person when you go out and have that tested in the nitty gritty of the real world. That's when you'll see where you trip up in your blind spots. It's easy to think you're awesome and everything's great when you're just sitting in meditation on your own. That's like, well, that's again a relative, subjective and relative statement. For some people, that just turns up all kinds of hidden, re, um, repressed stuff that they haven't dealt with. But after you've meditated for a year or so, that would have already come up. All that, if you've done it properly, that would have already come up. And for me, for instance, it's easy to, to be cool and calm when I'm sitting by myself with my timer and meditating. That's when I get out there or you know, people start annoying me or whatever. <laughs> or, get, or the average person in America is like getting into traffic on the way to work, you know, usually in the morning will just like get you going. <laughs> so that's where you get to practice your virtues. And not just practice, but grow them, because that's how you develop them. Uh, yeah, it's like uh, when you read a book on jujitsu and then you roll, right, and you find out whether you really got it. <laughs> and then you gotta keep doing it, because the more you do it, drill it or whatever, the better you get with it. Okay, so now we get to true self and self-cultivation. And uh, I mentioned this a few times before. Uh, this is my own spin on it. And uh, it is backed up by Russell Brand and some other sources. But um, this is how, this, is, this was more of like my insight, my aha moment for connecting with the, tw the 12 steps. And then, then that was what motivated me to go deeper. This talk of the higher power, I was trying to reconcile this with modern atheism or agnosticism. <clears throat> and uh, there is a great evidence-based evidence literature or evidence-based approach, one of the rare ones, in therapy called IFS. And you've probably seen me on other videos reference this. IFS stands for Internal Family Systems Therapy. Don't let the family part throw you off. <laughs> it, was, it came out of actual family therapy. But IFS is um, the best and most robust theory and um, approach to discovering your true self and its relation to your various parts. So if you want to get into the free videos that I've got on that, you can go to the, this four-part series on the practical psychology for extraordinary living, videos three and four. I also go deeper into that in true, the course called True Self and in Freedom You online and in Lifestyle Mastery. There's a whole module on it. And the true self is that part in you that is the coach or the conductor, the orchestra, the coach of the team that has, for most people, been locked up in the whatever, in, in some room somewhere or just like gagged and tied up because the other players, the other parts uh, didn't trust the leader and uh, just took over and it's like, get out of the way. We're going to take over because you didn't protect us from mom, from dad or from whatever. And then the, those other parts are just like little kid parts or immature parts and they just start taking over and it's all a mess and that's how inner conflicts arise. So the, the therapeutic process is Discovering your true self, and the therapist stands in as your true self. The true self right now is like bound and gagged, so the therapist is the one who's going to take the conductor's podium, and ding, 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 okay, everybody, all right, you trombonist, go over there, you know, like, okay, you're, and you, who keeps standing up and doing solos, you're not called for right now, you just take a rest, and drop that violin, and go back and play the timpanis, because that's what you originally were, all right, and, or like, maybe we don't know what this violinist who keeps screwing it up, like, blah, 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 is really doing. And so like the soloist who keeps, who's not, not very good right now, uh, but you had to stand up because everybody was chaotic. So the soloist stood up and now everyone's like, oh, okay, that's where we are in the piece. All right. So now the soloist, and what happens in therapy is you speak to the soloist. So put down the violin. What would you really like to do? Well, I've always wanted to play the timpani. Oh, well, go and explore that. So then the person goes over that part and boom, boom. Or what is the timpani? Boom, 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 boom. And they play that part, right? And like, oh, I really like this. Or maybe you just want to do the triangle. Bing. <laughs> whatever it is, right? Go and relax. Do the thing that you really want to do. And that's where that's directly uh, addressing the question you asked. Like that part that's overworked. If it didn't have to work, what would it do? Well, for a while, it should just rest. But now it might actually have something that it wants to do. So that's your true self. So that your true self, the therapist stands in at your true self and then says, "Hey, true self, come on over here." True self comes like scared because no one wants to trust him. And then over the period of the sessions, of the period of time in the sessions, the, the true self stands up on the podium, and then the players learn to trust the true self, and the therapist stands back and eventually disappears. 
Right. And then sometimes the therapist is like, the coach's coach is like, hey, you know, and just coaches that true self through. But the true self is that part of you that knows what to do. And if you, it, this might sound really ethereal. And if you want it, if you want to actually have an experience of it, I provide that through uh, the true self course. And it's also in Freedom U and in, oh, yeah, that's it, Freedom U and in, in the true self course. <clears throat> now, through the 12 step program, you can contact the parts of you that already know, that part of you that already knows what to do. And that will happen as you go through this. Because as you mature, you discover there is this part of you that knows when you're about to lose it. There's that part of you that's like, oh, like, don't do that. And then you just like shut up and you go and do it. Right? That's, that's why I say that tension. That tension is right there. You're like that, you could also call this your conscience. Right? And there might be many parts that have that operate as your conscience, by the way. So my, but the true self is certainly one of those. And that tension is where that true self is now getting gagged again or getting thrown out. And just like, okay, let's attend to that. You know what you ought to do. You know you ought to put that ice cream back in there. You know you ought to sit back down and meditate a bit more. You know what you need to do. But every, your other parts are not listening to that true self. So you're like, fuck off. You know, why, you know, why shouldn't I? Just go and do it. You earned it, whatever, right? Whatever the dialogue is. But there's a part of you that will get, become more prominent. That part of you that is your higher self. And um, we have, like I said, those meditations available for you. Not just that contacting your true self, but also finding the positive intent of your various parts that will lead you to that higher self as well. So in this process of the 12-step program, you will end up cultivating the character traits of a sound ideal. I believe that is a term right out of the anonymous work. A sound ideal. And these sound ideals are specific to various roles in your life. So there's a sound ideal as a husband, as a father, as an employer, as a friend, etc. And you can simply ask yourself if you want to tap into that, what would my sound ideal be like in this position, in this role in my life? What are the character traits of this person? How can I act in accordance with those character traits? In fact, that's why at the Bangkok summit, we went over uh, virtues and vices in, um, rel like, as they pertain to uh, dating specifically, but then related areas as well. Okay, so much to say about the true self and self-cultivation. In fact, I've created whole separate courses on true self and whole separate courses on self-cultivation. So step 10 is reflection. Am I committed to daily growth? How do I prove this? What evidence do I have that I'm actually committed to this? Is it just intellectual assent or am I actually doing something? Am I prepared to be alert to the inevitable deviations or mistakes that will come? Am I willing to hold myself accountable to another human being whenever I am deeply disturbed? Can I be self-compassionate and trust in my higher power? And that, by the way, so I, I presented in the earlier slide, that's, that's my view. That's how I take that. That's me. So you might actually believe in, a, in an external higher power. So that will work just as well for you. And even if it doesn't exist in reality, it will still help you right through the 12-step 12 pro, 12 program. Like you just said, it could be anything. Okay, uh, do I consciously try to live a life contrary to the defective impulses that previously governed my life? Deep questions. Each of these could take you a whole day to unravel. Welcome back from lunch. I am uh, medicated for my cold and now stuffed. Okay, step 10 reflection is where we left it off. So now we're moving into step 11. Step 11, right out of the AA Big Book. We saw through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Russell Brand's interpretation, stay connected to your new perspective. And uh, this is uh, reminding yourself on a consistent basis of uh, what you've um, the new insights, new views, perspective that you've adopted, and going deeper as you grow in your knowledge and experience with um, the program. <clears throat> so let's take a, a deeper look at addiction and what that is. Addiction is driven by these, well, underlying needs, underlying impulses. Active addi addiction is driven by the need to reconnect by using some externalized means. Right? So I gave that definition earlier. Externalized object, 
trying to meet your needs through an externalized way. Uh, if you've been through any of my multi-week courses, you've already done your own needs analysis and figured out your hierarchy of needs. Uh, we start with your seven universal human needs, and this is drawing on the work of Maslow and Tony Robbins, as well as Carl Jung and Freud, on the fact that what we're trying to do as we do these, as we go through these neurotic behaviors, is trying to meet needs that are uh, ingrained in us as human beings and are actually start off as healthy needs. So the seven universal needs, that is, needs that all human beings are born with are the needs for security, and then for variety, and for significance, uh, for connection, love, and growth, and contribution. So we start there, and then we get into the needs that are more specific to you as an individual, and you do your hierarchy of values in, uh, among other places, Invincible Module 3. Okay, so you have a deeper understanding of your needs, hopefully, after having done those courses with me. So you know what I'm referring to, that there are real needs that, are, that need to be met, but that you're trying to meet them through these unhealthy uh, mechanisms. <clears throat> so the standard way to do this is a self-centered approach, a self-centered, individualistic, egocentric approach. And there's a sub-bullet here on the difference between being self-centered and selfish. So a lot of people make this mistake, and I've written uh, academic papers drawing out this distinction between self-centered and selfish, because that in Chinese philosophy for thousands of years, they have been fighting against a lot of their self-cultivation strategies and programs have been to combat the self-centeredness of human nature, or that is the, um, the, the sin of human nature, self-centeredness. <clears throat> and self-centeredness is different from selfish. Here's, an, here's a, uh, an illustration of this. I'm drawing here from C.S. Lewis, who's an awesome thinker and just a great writer. So you can imagine somebody who is selfish, and that's somebody who takes from you to meet his or her own needs. So let's say I'm selfish, I see that you have a coffee, I happen to want a coffee, I'll just take your coffee. So a lot of, of society's rules and laws are instituted to prevent that sort of thing. But the, one of the benefits of it is it's transparent. I get it. You want my coffee. I also want that coffee. I understand where you're coming from, and you're just acting out on that. So it's my duty to say, uh-uh, hey, those are, that's mine. Hands off. And then there are rules and laws to prevent that. Great. Selfishness is easily dealt with and is transparent. And it's actually just like prostitutes are, and this might trigger some people, are more transparent and in some ways more, have more integrity than those who are actually prostitutes but don't tell you. All right, gold diggers, for instance. Self-centeredness is much more pernicious and it's harder to deal with. And it is, in fact, at the base of the narcissistic condition. And that's what we're born with, by the way, right? The focus on the self. And in fact, in developmental psychology, the theory is that when we pop out of the, the womb, we are uh, narcissistic, we are self-centered. We, in fact, don't even know the distinction between our bodies and the rest of the world. Okay, so the self-centered approach would be uh, and we, we are that way as babies. We, we don't know the uh, um, I, the self, other distinction. We have to learn that as we go along in our human lives. So here's an example from non-baby life and adult life. There's a, uh, your Aunt Martha. And as she takes care of you when you visit, she asks you if you would like a pot of tea. She, yeah, we're going to close that door. <clears throat> um, she gives you a pot of tea. As she's pouring it, she talks incessantly about herself and her problems. But the whole time, she's meeting your needs. She's like trying to figure out whether you would like some crumpets or some scones or whatever it is. Or some, would you like some more uh, cream or sugar with your tea? And as she's doing all of this, she's talking incessantly about herself because she's self-centered. But it's not so obvious. It's hard to beg out of that. It's hard to point that out. You're still just all obsessed about you. It's your whole universe is still revolving around you but you're not taking from me, so you're not selfish, right? But the, the problem is, is actually more central, it's more, or more basic. It's that you're actually operating from a self-centered paradigm. So this is at the root of all of the, um, well, I, what I believe is the root of uh, the Asian traditions, and they're all fighting against this, excessive focus on the self. And that is actually also the problem uh, and the essential human condition and why we end up in addictive cycles. Many forms of addiction are much subtler than the overt ones, as we covered, right? Drugs and alcohol, those are just more obvious on the outside. And the long-form con type of addiction, the addiction to getting uh, people to like you or respect you or to get girls in your life in, in a way that will stroke your ego and also stroke your other parts, these are all going, can easily lead into an addictive cycle. And they're much subtler. In fact, there are some of these are so uh, they're so socially accepted that they're even endorsed. Uh, 
So here are some examples of ones that are more socially accepted and maybe among your buddies when you're acting alpha or tough guy or hey bro, bro language, bro science, whatever, you are talking about or bragging about or trading stories around the acquisition of sex, money, fame, controlling or manipulating other people or even just something quite innocent which is like on the outside especially going to beautiful places, going to more and more places and showing that off or show off experiences. Um, ballooning or something like that and you see these people not actually in, in enjoying the actual experience or being present there but they're they're taking photos that they can show off on Instagram for instance is one way to show off those experiences or pretty things etc right so in the end all of these externalized means of meeting your needs will fail you and will eventually um, not meet your needs and will be destructive as you continue to pursue them the needs drives and impulses behind the behavior however are legitimate and often universal. The primary fuel for the defective behaviors is self-centeredness. <clears throat> this is a, a thesis that I present directly. Self-centeredness is at the root of it all. <clears throat> the overriding needs, that is the needs that are most commonly present in addictive cycles of behavior, are love and connection. Maybe connection more at the surface level, love underneath it. And this is something that I would like to, well, we could spend an entire day discussing the condition of anonymity as part of the 12 steps. It was a genius move among the founders. Um, it was a great way to remove the ego from the equation, as well as make it more approachable in terms of practicality. Uh, but in terms of philosophy, providing that confession element as, as cloaked through the anonymity. Okay, so self-centeredness being the primary uh, the primary like thing that's fueling those drives, and then the fact that the drives themselves are often healthy. So then we move into what you can do about it. Learning to be uh, content being alone, and then meditation. Those are separate things. I happen to put them on the same slide. <laughs> being content alone and then meditation. Though often you're meditating alone, so they're related. <clears throat> so... One of the best things you can do to get out of this cycle, or even just to see whether you're in this cycle, is to train yourself to be at ease alone. And this is going to be extra hard for extroverts. Uh, introverts might rejoice at this, like, hey, I get an extra advantage here. <clears throat> and that's true. But being at ease, at, at ease alone means that when you're alone, you don't feel a lack. And uh, a lot of dudes who are nice guys feel the neediness when they're alone. They feel lonely. And they try to meet that need through doing other shit, other stuff, instead of just staying with it. Staying with the tension, as I mentioned earlier, pausing. You can just literally do this directly. Spend more time with yourself, sitting alone, quietly, reflecting, or meditating. A great use of this time is to reflect through those 12-step questions. Or you can meditate. For those who aren't used to this, so one kind, common type of addiction, especially, um, well, not, not so much for guys who are trying to get better with women, but for the guys who are already better with women, or good with women, is to fill their time with, with people. And uh, there's, there, that can have a very addictive quality. As I got better with women, I also felt guilty if I wasn't out socializing, out approaching. And that's a healthy impetus to connect with other people. But then obviously it can become addictive. It can feel like I'm inadequate if I don't have cool people around me or beautiful women around me or doing things to me. So I got to go and get that. So that reminds me that, yes, I am the man or some kind of narcissistic reminder. So I constantly filled my free time with social activities. And even as an introvert, um, I was doing that, training myself to be that way. And of course, there's a positive outcome to it. But then when uh, it easily goes overboard, which is how I took it, and even when you're alone, you feel like you need to do something else to become worthy of some future goal or um, to, to just fill up that tension within you. A lot of people who then, after going through that type of phase, embark on meditation, find that a lot of, uh, what's the word, chaos comes up or a lot of swirling around of your thoughts. And it's hard for you to achieve any kind of silence in your meditation. And that's a necessary part of your transformation. It's part of your chrysalis period where you are cocooned and just before you become a butterfly you need to stay with that tension and that is something that uh, that's that tension is something you need to get comfortable with. Now if you are used to filling up all of your free time 
with people or going out often um, and connecting with people in a kind of addictive manner or in an unhealthy manner, you can ease into the solitude. So you don't have to force yourself into a silent meditation retreat or anything prematurely. You can work your way into it. But the point is to set aside time to encounter yourself <clears throat> and to become at ease with yourself. And uh, <clears throat> there's a period in my life when uh, I discovered, uh, I guess this is a quality problem, I had um, the skills to <clears throat> pick up women, to connect with dudes who could open a lot of doors uh, to women as well as to other resources. And I over-relied on that. And then I had an enforced um, solitude where I just booked a, a hotel for a week or two and just stayed there and didn't go out except to use the gym. And at first it wasn't, it was, that was by accident because I just didn't feel like going out and, and I was doing really hard workouts, which made me really tired. I needed to just recover. So I was getting food delivery from paleo, paleo food delivery and just like lying there on the couch like uh, as my body was recovering from these workouts and, and just shoveling bulking food into my mouth. And then, uh, and then having to deal with the, the sleepiness and the lethargy that comes after a big meal like that. But then I realized, then I discovered that this is a very valuable time. And the slowly, over the course of weeks and months, of making that a regular thing, Monday to Friday, pretty much just in my hotel room, <laughs> it was, a, was what helped me to slough off that need, the neurotic need, to fill that time with some activity some busyness, some busyness that would allow me to earn my worth so that I, I didn't feel inadequate to just drive away that fear that I'm not good enough. I mean, you can fill it with gym time, luckily it's just one workout a day. Uh, you can fill it with going out and trying to pick up chicks to, to fill that validation uh, and that sort of thing. But you can also, best use of that time is to sp spend time alone to be content alone. When you can be content alone, by the way, for the guys who are trying to just get better with women, I guess, is a main goal, uh, you, that neediness will go away. Um, so balance it out, however, uh, right? So if you do two or three weeks alone, very likely if you, are, you have a human need for connection with other human beings that is not being met. So you want to factor that in. Uh, and what you will do is you will develop an ability to turn away from the stimulation and turn within. To reject further activity. To distra that distracts or soothes your ennui, your feeling of meaninglessness or emptiness or unworthiness or insignificance or whatever it is that's ah, just not, doesn't make you feel good when you're just sitting there by yourself. Just stay with it. Endure a moment longer and then another moment longer and a little bit longer. <clears throat> Mantra meditation was one of the things that saved me. And in fact, that during that period, it just coincided with when I went off into a different country to live for a while on my own, um, away from Singapore, where I'd been living for f five years at that point, I think, four or five years. <clears throat> no, five, six years almost at that point. I had just, I had just taken my four-day mantra meditation course with Stefan Rivali. And uh, that allowed me to just spend the luxury of twice a day meditation, 20 minutes, sometimes leading to 25 or 30. If it was going real well, just add an extra five minutes on that timer. Or actually, I, I basically set my timer so it's 50 minutes, and then I set bells at 20, you know, 18, 20, 25, 30. So it just keeps running if I want to stay with it. And that was a really transformative period. So I emerged from that week of solitude, very centered and grounded, but also able to be detached from the emotions that would have clouded me earlier, that would have dragged me down, or the patterns of speaking or thoughts that would have dragged me down. And uh, it also helped me to see uh, more of what I believe now is objective reality of the toxicity in the nightclubs and the bars that I didn't notice before because I was involved in it. I was embroiled in it. It helps you to float above the swamp of the day-to-day -day life. And what it does is also helps you to access your ignored, hidden, or latent aspect of yourself that will empower and lead you as you re-enter re the busy world. So it will help you to access that higher power, that higher self, the true self, Without meditation, I, I don't even know how people can do it. I think it would be almost impossible to create. So one of the first things you ought to do, and I put this in module one of Freedom U, is a required habit, is to develop a habit of meditation. Daily, if not twice a day, I recommend if you're a man and you want to develop your masculinity to start with mantra meditation. <clears throat> but mindfulness is 
more, more, doc, more uh, better documented and has a lot more resources supporting it. So either way is good. I've done a podcast, by the way, with Stefan Rivali on the differences between um, mantra meditation, mindfulness meditation, and mindfulness. So go check that out. If you Google it, you'll find it. Here's a great quote from Russell Brand's book, Recovery. <clears throat> and this is the, 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 the way you can spot this pattern. Okay? If you ever say this to yourself. If only you can get the right shoes or the right car or the right girl or the job. If people would just respect you, not reject you, protect you. If you could be like Sophia Loren or Sean Penn or Muhammad Ali or Lady Gaga or Thinner or someone else, anybody else, always reaching outwards, always legitimizing the twitching and unfocused drive that will not let you abide. So sitting with yourself in your solitude and finding contentment there is pretty much the prerequisite for any kind of maturity at any meaningful level. So here's some reflection questions, just three, four, step 11. Do I accept that there are things I don't know about, uh, that, that I don't know about reality? That in fact, no one currently knows about reality. Am I willing to attune to and live in service of my higher self or power? And then to create a habit of daily meditation. And then, drum roll to the last step. Step 12, having had a spiritual awakening I think it's singular. As a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to addicts and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Brand's interpretation. Look at life less selfishly, be nice to everyone, and help people if you can. So this is the contribution component. So now you have done all, have all have had all of this growth. The next natural step is to contribute to others, to let that overflow out of yourself and benefit others. If I don't continue to grow emotionally and spiritually, I will always default to self-centeredness. So this is the point I've been making uh, repeatedly in other videos, that if you're not growing, you're dying. As biological beings, we need to be moving forward or time will just pull us back. And the default, for, because of our human condition, is an excessive focus on the self. In fact, all of our emotional pains come about as a result of an excessive focus on the self. And when you can get out of that pain by just moving outside yourself, either through contributing to others or being grateful for what you already have, just getting out of that and seeing it from a new perspective and focusing on new things. A major component of all of these 12 steps is sponsorship or mentorship. So here's at the end, we, we give you a reminder about mentorship. Find a mentor who has been there and come through the other side. A cool quote from Russell Brand here. If you're getting advice from another addict and it isn't coming from the program, then you're listening to a junkie. And on Reddit and places like that, there are so many other people who are still stuck in their addiction to this, these, this thought patterns, right? Like, wait, where is it here? Uh, where's that Russell Brand quote? <clears throat> oh, that's earlier. That if you don't get the right shoe, so for the guys on Reddit who are trying to, you know, do this, pick, trying to trade pickup artist tactics with each other or red pill tactics or something like that. They're still stuck in that mindset where they're all searching for the X. And it's just junkies giving advice to other junkies. The advice should not be coming solely from the self. They should be drawing on the collective wisdom and research that has come before. Also, Russell, Russell Brand here. I am as mad as they are, as mad as you are, often more mad. Let's face it. But I'm not using my own Barmy Bible as a guide. I am referring to the principles laid out here as I understand them. And I try to personally uh, report rather than theorize, like theorize it in blank, uh, from, from thin air. Uh, I noticed that a toxic way of approaching learning is that it's not valuable if it's been said before. I would say the opposite. If it's not been said before, it's highly suspect. <laughs> so especially when it comes to psychology. And uh, I could spend, I mean, we could really, if we wanted to go in depth, do a graduate study, graduate course on this for 12 weeks on the 12 steps and take an entire three hours on each step with readings supplemented, drawing from classical sources as well as modern sources. These are all well documented. I'm just the person passing this information on to you and then guiding you through based on my own experience and what I've seen in all the research. <clears throat> and look for that. That's what you want to be looking for. Not someone who purports to present a brand new, never before exp uh, explained theory. So these are important aspects of finding a mentor. Contribution as growth. So that in the seven needs analysis, the top two needs, or the, the last two needs, the, the spiritual needs, 
our contribution and growth. And in fact, they are, they can be the same, that you grow through contributing. And that, in fact, that is the antidote to self-centeredness, to be of service to others while relying on the collective wisdom of others. It's not a, and, and then the saying that this program is not a cure, <clears throat> but a daily reprieve. And the focus on one day at a time, one step at a time. And if you fall, it's still the same. One day at a time, one step at a time. <coughs> okay, so wrapping up here, bringing it back to you and a broader definition of addiction. If any of these are true, then you're on the spectrum of addiction. If you are lost in your life, or you're afraid to admit to even yourself how much you are fearful of the future, or of death, or of other people, or of being poor, or of not being good enough, or sexy enough, or thin enough, or tough enough, or alpha enough, or famous enough, if you feel you are not enough, and that if you could only X, Y, or Z, then everything would be fine, then you are on the spectrum of addiction. Unexamined hubris is easily indulged. Uh, that's a deep quote. We don't have to unpack that right now. <laughs> so, step 12, reflection. Almost at the end here. What are your motivations right now? Is it to get something? Is it power, prestige, glory? Have you done anything for anyone else today, especially without being found out, being anonymous? Have you meditated or connected? Have you turned to anyone else for support? Have I experienced a deep change in my thinking, feeling, and behavior? Am I willing to share my life to help others? How can I particularly, how can I particularly help others? How can I improve? Do I prioritize my character development? And just to circle back to the most important themes for the long form con addict, the everyman, the self, so here, unconscious drives, multiple selves, self-centeredness, and oneness. This all goes back to an excessive focus on the self self-centeredness, where everything comes back to you. And even when you do good works, so to speak, it's for you, um, so that you can shine a light on that for yourself, or you can put it on your resume, or, or just to, so you can show off in some way, or so that you can now believe that you are good, you're enough. Even that can taint that, right? It's still self-centered. Um, and that's at the root of it all. You have to get outside yourself and stop thinking about yourself. That, by the way, is also the prerequisite to being in flow. When, as soon as you focus on the self, you're out of flow. Have you ever played, like, I learned this playing basketball in high school when the cute girls would be up in the stands. And I play great in practice when there's no one there watching, just the other, you know, my team. And as soon as we're in a real game and there's spectators watching, I start to think, is my hair right? Uh, you know, how do I look as I'm coming down the court? And as soon as that happens, boom, I, it dribbles on my foot, or I pass it to the wrong person, or I'm not in the right position, or I'm not in the game. I'm not lost in the game. I'm thinking about me. Right? That takes you out of flow. And that's just from a performance standpoint. If you still are nar pursuing narcissistic ends, it's not even a very good way to do that. <clears throat> but ideally, you would find, the only way to find fulfillment and happiness is to come outside yourself, to remove that focus from yourself. And a symptom is that you're in, uh, embroiled in self-centeredness is that instead of feeling gratitude or blessed, you feel the pride or ego gratification. And this is a very tricky symptom. It keeps coming up. Even though, even though I've, I've worked with people who I would consider to be full-on narcissists who are kind of dangerous, and yet they, they don't know how to pick up women. They don't know how to flirt or banter. They have a, a certain degree of Asperger's. But... They, they, they want to learn how to, do, how to, how to get girls. Uh, and they keep, every time they get a victory, they pat themselves on the back, like, yes, I'm getting closer to the ideal self, right, that we started with one of the earlier, earlier slides, that will then, everything will be A-OK. -okay. Everything will finally come together and will be good. And another symptom that I've mentioned in a lot of videos is if you're having ED in the act after the pickup, that's a big sign that it was really mostly about your pride or ego, getting that girl, and that you're not present. Right. So if you are feeling that, like these are quite common, like these things were mentioned. If you have any kind of, if you feel unease or anxiety or um, basically like this meaninglessness of your life, emptiness, which is pretty common, right? And if you ever just stop it from your busyness of your life and focus on that, it, it's pretty, and, and you're thoughtful. It should come up pretty readily. 
And instead of feeling gratitude or feeling blessed, you feel like, I need to do more stuff so I can finally feel good enough so that my ego can feel gratified, that everything's okay, and that will last for just a little while until the next thing happens. Then look at self-centeredness. Think that maybe this is accurate for me as a depiction or description of the state that I'm in or the cycle that I've been stuck in. And give it a chance. Give it a try to try a 12-step recovery for your long-form con addiction. And that's exactly what we do in Freedom U. It's in seven modules instead of 12. I've experimented with 10, and that was already way too long. Um, but uh, it's very similar to the 12-step process that, <clears throat> that we go through in Freedom U. Uh, so finally, the uh, reminder that the, the drives underlying the addictive behavior are universal, probably, and can be healthy. For instance, connection and love is often what's at the bottom of it, that you're try what you're trying to get out of that. Of course, significance is wrapped up in there, and so is certainty and uncertainty. And in fact, as I've said before, if any activity meets three out of those seven needs, it will become addictive. It's just it's meeting too many needs, that one activity. You just keep going back to it. So a lot of addictive behaviors you can see meet all five of the base needs, or four of the base needs. Uh, you're going to connect with it somehow. Um, you're not going to probably feel love. But that's why I separate love and connection. But connection, significance, certainty, uncertainty, it's all wrapped up in there. You're certain that if you do this drug or jerk off to this porn, you'll get some dopamine hits. Uh, it's also uncertain because you don't know what you're going to get. Oh, I wonder what channel. Or I don't know what's going to happen if I shoot up this time. We'll see what happens. A lot of uncertainty happens when you do these destructive behaviors. Uh, significance, right? Like now I'm taking care of myself. Also, it feeds your narcissistic core as well, that you're focused on the self and meeting those needs, meeting the gratification. And then, of course, you're connecting, usually. Some, like, it might just be through the porn. <laughs> you're connecting with the, the cyber slut, but uh, you could also be connecting with other people in the, in the enablers, right? So there are all kinds of ways that, that addictive behavior could be, um, could be sucking you in by meeting your needs in unhealthy ways. And then the breakage is going to take some endurance to sit with that tension and go deeper into your mind, right, into your emotions. What you need to do is to replace it eventually with healthier and better vehicles, better channels or avenues or pathways to meet those needs. And in fact, that's what we do in Freedom You, uh, in Invincible, Lifestyle Mastery, and Rocks All the Relationships, looking at how you're going about meeting your needs and looking at how uh, the conditions for those, and then finding new conditions that are more conducive to a healthy, empowered lifestyle in life. Okay, so wrapping up. As a recap, we went over the origins and efficacy of the 12-step program, or 12-step programs. We looked specifically at the 12 steps as put out in the AA Big Book and help, uh, hopefully translated uh, by Russell Brand. We looked at repeatedly the higher self or the higher power, and we pointed out that there's a spectrum of addiction, a continuum, and that at root, at the root of it is self-centeredness, and the antidote to that is connection, because that's actually the need that you're trying to meet, and you just need to meet that need in a healthier manner. Now, I recommend for those who want to go deeper that you pick up Russell Brand's book, Recovery, and of course, all of these different courses I've mentioned along the way, like Freedom U. When those become available, those are the ways that I've uh, done it for myself and have made available to anyone um, who wants to go through it in a recorded online format. Freedom U, in fact, is a live course online, so we walk everybody through that. And it's a group community, so we also work into that, the community aspect. Okay, great, so then we'll just get into some questions. What, actually, what I plan for this is to do a meditation that will directly address these core issues. And it's just a really short, like less than 10 minutes. Very pleasant, enjoyable, a nice after lunch meditation. You might doze off, that's okay too. <laughs>